Yes, we are giving her the chance to flourish and keep her personality. Hey folks, Masako X here. Now, this what if is not like any other what if story that we have on the channel. It's all to do with the idea of Gohan's partner, Videl. This is actually a three person effort between myself, Havrock and our pals Sophie B Powerhouse. You might recognize those names from our round table live streams. You can find Sophie's channel up top by the way. Together, we have been brainstorming what could realistically happen if the Dell got this chestnut, and I am packaging it myself, bringing it all together into a neat little bundle for you to consume and consider right now. So, let's get to it. To begin with, we are not going to be going through the whole rigmarole of Videl discovering the identity of the Golden Warrior, all of those hijinks, and then her initial forays with Gohan. That doesn't really change the outcome of this story too much, so what's the point of retreading old ground if it doesn't bring anything new to the table? We are also not going to be changing Gohan's starting point. He is just as soft, as Vegeta would put it, as he was in the original story. There's no change from his base. We are taking things from just when Videl issues her ultimatum to Gohan in exchange for her silence about who he really is, the great Saiyan Man. The story proper begins the day when Videl arrived at Mount Palzu, keen to pick a fight with Gohan and prove him wrong, only to get a fight in the form of Chi Chi, who is absolutely apoplectic with this young girl manipulating her darling firstborn son, all for the sake of information. And it's lucky that Chi Chi didn't lamp her one when Gohan and Goten arrived in the nick of time. The situation is very bleak, but Gohan and Goten ease the mood, thankfully, with Videl reluctantly promising to go along with the whole charade on the proviso that she doesn't hurt or touch Gohan. But the young girl's just keen to get all this socializing over with and get on with learning how to fly and be done with it so she can go home, under her own steam ideally. She had been sort of curious with this idea ever since she had watched the Cell games on TV, from ZTV of course and Jimmy Firecracker, and saw that yellow haired warrior and the bug man that her father had beaten floating in the sky. Was that actually possible for anyone to learn? She wanted some of that if it were true, but in the back of her mind, understandably given who her father was, she just hoped it didn't involve any string or mirrors. In her later teenage years, she kind of forgot about it, but it all came back to the surface when she saw the Golden Warrior in action, doing the same exact thing with the same hair and agile motions without a string in sight. But with that doubt in the back of her mind, she was skeptical when Gohan was calmly teaching what was natural to him as if it were just the most normal thing ever. She was getting impatient as a result. She wanted to learn how to fly now, not have an impromptu lecture in the middle of a field. She didn't want to be coming all this way for some theory. She could get that at high school. And Goten could see her frustration in action and said in a very calming and cooing way that his bro was really good at this and that he was excited to learn himself how to fly. That made her stay. The very thought of her having less patience than a seven year old was something too much to bear for herself. And so she waited and took in the theory reluctantly and then practiced. There was a limit though. When Gohan suggested that she cut her hair, she pouted immediately and went home like in the original. And also like in the original, she returned the next day with her trademark pixie cut, a personal favorite of mine, and quickly grasped the reason why Gohan had requested her to cut her hair in the first place. Now realizing that this wasn't all hogwash and Gohan trying to put his preferences on her, Videl steamed on and proceeded to do some light sparring with Gohan after learning how to fly. She was actually getting more and more excited, genuinely excited, with this feeling of power and lightness. Not only was she able to move her limbs more swiftly than ever, she could fly too! <laughs> she'd never have to pay for fuel for a car ever again. Well, I mean, okay, she'd have to buy lunch for herself because it would take a lot out of her, but hey, that was much more agreeable and tasty than the traditional method. Gohan was noticing this rapid progress, and in this story, his synaptic firings were changing too. Instead of just getting a crush, like in the typical high school antics and romance teenage angst and doing the standard training regimen, he was actually getting fired up. Something that he hadn't felt since he was training with his father back in the room of spirit and time. He had actually really missed this feeling bizarrely, but 
he had to put that all to one side for the sake of his studies and of course his mother, because Goku wasn't around, and ensuring that his mother that he would be a good scholar and make the most of this peacetime to get a proper amount of scholarship studies in and get the education necessary to have a good job because that's the only thing Chi Chi thinks about. That being said, he was thrilled to see something before him change dramatically that he hadn't experienced in years. There was another feeling though. He felt like Mr. Piccolo. Was this what it was like to have a pupil and to see them grow right before you? Now, okay, granted, he had done some light training and teaching with his brother Goten, but that wasn't quite the same, if you know what I mean. That was more just like an older brother showing his siblings the ropes and the school of hard knocks about life. And I mean literal hard knocks. This, with the Dell, was so much more different. It was special. He couldn't wait to tell Piccolo that he had a student. The look on his face, he'd be so proud. But okay, first, he actually had to ensure that he didn't scare her away, that he didn't go too far with this. This is good work for Dell, he nodded with enthusiasm. At this rate, you could get real far in the World Martial Arts Tournament. Huh? That thing? I'm pretty sure I could have done before I met you. To tell you the truth, I'd actually forgotten about it. But then she actually goes a little bit further deciding to tease him for that remark. Wait, are you suggesting I wouldn't have been good enough without your help? Gohan, sure enough, panicked and clarified that, oh, he was just complimenting her. She sticks her tongue out and bonks him on the head. Gotcha. He had no clue that he was punked. In honesty though, really? The tournament was all her father would ever talk about, especially since he actually won it the last time out. He was the defending champion, of course, and he had insisted on her taking part as well, not only for her to have some fun, but also it would look very good for the PR department of Satan Enterprises. I mean, think about the headlines. The daughter of our savior takes up the mantle. That was a pretty hollow reason to enter, definitely, even she could tell, but this right now gave us some kind of purpose. If Gohan was super strong, enough to become the Golden Warrior, sort of like what happened in the Cell games, then she could maybe get a similar spark and get something out of this boring tournament after all. This was the catalyst I was talking about for her to get more involved in the training. She kept coming back day after day, and her power also increased day after day as Gohan upped the ante. And I mean, okay, it was still child's play to him in terms of her power, but he could visibly tell her progress, but then a thought occurred to him. Could he press the Goku button? Uh, no, not that button, the other button. Say, I know we don't have much time left before the tournament, but I've got an idea of how you could get way stronger in much less time. Huh? What? Have you got some kind of time machine, Gohan? Gohan shifts a little bit and laughs awkwardly. <laughs> well, sort of. He then explains how the room of spirit and time works up on the lookout, but Videl is immediately suspicious at this. How does that thing, if it's real, even work? Trust me, there are many days where I think the same thing, but I can show you any time if you like. It's easy since you can fly too at the moment. It means I don't have to carry you. What are you saying? Am I heavy or something? She eyes him up viciously. N -n -n no, I meant that as in you can fly yourself and you don't need my help? He shrugs and fortunately this was enough to calm Videl down. As they fly to the lookout, Gohan considers the length of time that they should actually be training in there. Now in theory they could stay a whole day, one year inside the chamber, and be all perfectly fine. Videl could get really powerful and really not be too far off the rest of the dragon team. I mean okay, she would at least be able to put up some kind of fight and resistance against the likes of Yamcha or Chaozu for a bit. But then something put him off that idea. Well, three things actually. Firstly, Chi Chi was already sort of touchy about him using that room after having lost a year of Gohan's childhood beforehand, so that was already weighing on his mind. Then there was the worry of their relationship, their budding one, and the master people dynamic. If that soured, things weren't going well, and it ended badly, how awkward would that be? And then most importantly, they were teenagers with a hyper-accelerated relationship. Who's to say, as Sophie put it in our discussions and brainstorming sessions, that Dell would come out of the room looking a little chubbier than she did when she entered? Hmm? I mean, Gohan couldn't bear the thought. He would like to be a father, sure, but not right now. There's plenty of studying to do. 
By the time they get to the lookout, his mind was made up though. Hey Dende, he hailed his friend. Is it okay we use the time chamber for a week or so? Dende spots Gohan and says that, oh yeah, it should be perfectly fine. And when Videl asked about who this guy is, Gohan informs Videl that Dende was the guardian of Earth and in charge of the special chamber. So does that make you God? Videl says with trepidation. Dende thinks for a second to come up with a reasonable answer. I mean, I guess. My job is to oversee this world and ensure that it stays safe, so you could say I'm your god, though I'm still getting used to the notion myself. He chuckles, but the Dell is dumbstruck. What kind of friends did Gohan have? Anyway, the chamber awaited them, and in they went for one week, inside which equated to about 15 Earth minutes. Inside the room, Videl and Gohan trained without interruption, and this is where the two actually get to know each other a little more, much faster than before. Now, you think that their relationship was developing faster than the original? Think again. By the time they actually come out of here right now, they were firmly committed. During this time, Videl understood that Gohan wasn't a brash and arrogant twerp, full of tricks and illusions that her father had maybe alluded to and implied. She had basically been told many lies as a kid, she saw before her, here, right now, a sincere, kind and formidable young man who adored the pants off of her, head over heels in love. And yes, of course, he was a little dorkier than the guys that she usually attracted, but in a way, that was actually sort of a relief. Gohan here was uncomplicated and pure. He also did look nice and was strong. That helped too. He was the real deal, a complete package and Gohan himself was enamoured with Videl. He had never experienced this feeling before in his life. Sure, he had liked girls, but it never really manifested itself in this manner before. Since joining high school, he had actually garnered many eyes on him from the likes of the ladies. And that was just simply for existing. He was a lovable dork. He didn't know how to handle it, and so chose to focus on his studies even more, and was relieved to don the helmet and cape of his great Saiyaman persona just to escape the nervous tension. Here though, Videl made him feel comfortable, secure, elated. She was pretty great. Was this a sign that there was indeed more to life than studying? Well, yes. But that is until conferences show up later on! When it came to the actual training, this extra week of practice improved Videl's finesse no end. Not only did she obviously get physically stronger and more toned and muscular than in the original, but she actually also started, and this is something the original didn't really go into, understanding this newfound power. In the original, she was stronger thanks to Gohan's quick sparring sessions, but there was a problem. She had little comprehension because she didn't have the chance to, nor the ability to contain this power and when to use it. And as a result, like you saw, Spopovich's neck did a little 180. She went a little bit over the board there. With this extra time to concentrate, Gohan had the chance to teach Videl the importance of focusing her power for when she needed it most. You've made a lot of gains, so you might do something rash against normal folk if you're not careful. You have to understand when you need to use the power. Videl at first didn't get it, but then she did get it when Gohan again pointed out that she would be fighting against normal people for the most part in this contest. And if she did decide to fight all out, not tempering her energy all the time, she could seriously injure someone or even kill somebody without knowing it. She understood quickly after that. So as a result, we not only got a stronger Videl, but a more concentrated Videl. When they emerged, Videl's gains were notable and Dende said so, but she was a little disappointed with her progress. Thanks, God, but I couldn't get how to do those energy things. I failed. It's okay, Videl. You don't have to learn everything at once. There's plenty of time to learn. The main thing is that you're much stronger than when you entered. I'm sure you're going to do great in the tournament. I'll be watching from here. Gohan nodded as if to reaffirm Dende's thoughts. This did make her feel a little better, but it still got to the trainee that she didn't master key. When they left, Videl went back to her place to not only get some rest, but maybe do a little training in private. After a much needed shower and nap, she trained with her regular equipment and found that she had gotten better and not by a little. She could just casually lift her dumbbells, which before required noticeable effort. 40 pound weights, easy peasy. 80 pound weights, not a problem. She then eyed up the big guns, her father's kit. 
she prepared herself and focused her energy like Gohan had taught her, she was able to lift 500 pounds with little strain. But she did need to focus the whole time. But then her dad walked in and his jaw hit the floor. Videl! This snapped her out of her space and the weights just clattered to the ground. Luckily, she didn't hurt her foot. <laughs> How did you do that? You just benched what I benched as if it were nothing. He was amazed, but also kind of scared. Was this Gohan some kind of magician? She was nowhere near that strong yesterday. She chuckled and made excuses and platitudes to appease her father, but he was more proud than angry, of course. I mean, come on. His little girl is becoming a grown, strong lady and will do great in the tournament. The tournament indeed arrived and both Adele and Gohan met and showcased their newfound relationship, making their classmates rave and cheer, as well as making Arasa feel jealous, but also sort of happy for Gohan. It was a bit of a mixed bag overall for her. When it came to the draws, Videl and Gohan made it through to the top 16 like before, and she got very pumped. She had made it into the main matches on her own volition, without the need for her father to give her a buy or a let through. She had earned it herself, thanks to Gohan as well as her own determination. She had changed a lot in these few weeks and felt more assured than she could remember in the last few years. She was happy. She was also curious to see how well her power could fare in this contest against her first opponent in the top 16, Spopovich. Hercule noted that he wasn't all that strong, so he should be an easy warm-up for her. But then again, he looks completely different. Hmm, he shaved his head and everything. You better watch yourself, honey. I don't like the look of him. But Del nodded and gave her dad the thumbs up. The stage was set for the two fighters. They entered the ring. Spopovich doesn't bow, speak, or show any acknowledgement to Videl. He just simply stands there, waiting to do the deed. Videl is actually getting kind of cocky. What's the matter? You scared? Dad told me you were a pushover. That got nothing. Yep, her dad was right. Something's peculiar here. Gohan from the sidelines tells her not to be so aggressive with her words, as this is meant to be a contest of martial arts, not being sassy. Videl finds it cute that he would use the word sass. Gohan blushes. The fight is ready to begin. The announcer gives the order, and the two surge forward. Videl and Spopovich begin their battle, and Hercule is watching from the sidelines with a mixture of confidence and uncertainty. Sure, he had just seen his daughter the other day benching half a ton, something that he could struggle to do. But was that actually something to be proud of, and would it be enough? Was that Gohan all show and no substance? He decides to walk over to Gohan and project the aura of an authority and defending champion, as well as a very serious father. Hey, punk! Gohan turns looking confused. M me He says with timidity in his voice, hardly acting like a punk here. You had better not be teaching my daughter a bunch of parlor tricks! But I remember you lot during the fight with Cell, using all those illusions! And Videl's not one for those fantastical things. If she gets hurt on my watch, it's on to you, boy. I've got my eye on you. Gohan then tries to calmly explain that those weren't tricks. Internally exasperated that after all this time, Hercule still thinks what they did was fake, not the real deal. When Hercule turns away and looks to the ring, watching his daughter, Gohan's pleasant visage changes into a look of disgust. I know what I'm doing, old man. He rarely looked down on his elders, but right now, he decided to make an exception. Vegeta was also watching the fight as well as Piccolo. The two serious warriors keen to see what Gohan, the as of now strongest fighter on earth, well, I mean, well, before Goku came back, as well as his new pupil, would fare in this contest. Would the former be right in thinking that Gohan had gotten soft with his studies as of late? Or would Piccolo be vindicated? The fight was very exciting for all to see. Videl's concentration was higher than in the original, and she was able to use her small stature to her advantage with her extra speed, and easily outrun Spopovich, which made the hulking giant quite irritated. But despite this annoyed mood being extremely nettled, he really did not speak. On the sidelines, Yamu was getting a little worried. Master Bobbity is growing impatient, Spopovich. Finish this already. His expressions are more human than his comrades, but he too was focused on the matter at hand. Gather energy for their master. The Delvo was getting more and more pumped. She felt as light as a feather and got hit after hit on the big lug with very little effort. 
But over the next few minutes, she decided to turn up the wick, as it were, and her punches and kicks were getting stronger and stronger. Spopovich had absolutely no answer to this, this agility, and this is despite his strength being quite high. His technique was sloppy, and that was very bad. Even with this enhancement from Barbady, it was not enough to outmatch a recently trained and extremely passionate young fighter. Videl was thrilled. Gohan too was absolutely transfixed with this battle. Even Hercule was starting to soften to the idea that his daughter was showing real promise. In fact, she was probably outclassing even himself. He had better have been careful if she actually made it to the grand final and faced him. I mean, was the time right for the next generation to take over? Or did he want to be that really rare thing of being a back-to-back -back world martial arts champion? He was mulling over the headlines and potential PR spin on this notion when Videl decided to make his mind up for him, seemingly, landing a critical blow on Spopovich. Having played keep away, dodging him for a while, Spopovich's stamina had reduced to the point where he had fallen down on his stomach, unable to get up in the middle of the arena. Before he could do so, Videl had launched herself into the air and landed a massive double kick to his lower back, not enough to paralyze him, but enough to make sure he wouldn't go anywhere quickly, before jumping backwards and then punting him off with a simple kick out of the ring and out of the tournament. As you could tell, Fidel's a kicking girl. She could not believe the speed of it all. She'd won. She felt invigorated, as well as a little bit tired, but she had done it. She decided to chill a little bit, take in the atmosphere, and pull up the double arm left and victory sign that her father was famous for, and the crowd erupted with delight. They had witnessed, just now, the start of the Dell's adult tournament campaign. The young girl had carried on a chutzpah and spirited junior accolades, and was now ready to follow her father's footsteps, ensuring a Satan legacy in the big leagues. Gohan was jumping for joy, and Piccolo shot him a look of pride. Not bad, Gohan. I better teach you my clothes beam so that you can deck around your colors, eh? Your colors, Mr. Piccolo. If it hadn't been for you, we wouldn't be standing here today. Thank you. Piccolo nods and looks to Videl's victory some more. As for Vegeta, his looks are more just... Nah, satisfied for the moment. Good. He's focused. Goku was just... <laughs> wow, blown over. He was so stunned to see his first son becoming a proper master at such a young age. And even though that, that probably wasn't what Chi Chi had in mind for him, it was still a properly momentous thing to witness. And speaking of Chi Chi, even she was nodding in approval. As I suspected, Gohan is a great teacher. He will be an excellent professor before you know it. As Videl was about to get down from the ring to relax and prepare for the next round, something bad happened. Something shot right through her. A yellowish arc penetrated her midriff. And in that moment of shock, she had no clue what had happened, but everyone else did. They saw the whole thing. Yamu had fired a key blast at her, and even though the wound wasn't lethal, it was enough to ensure that she wouldn't be getting back up again and interfering anytime soon. As you might have suspected, her vulnerability to key and her inability to learn it at the moment got the better of her. She could not defend against that. Yamu cursed. Damn it, Spopovich. I didn't want to have to get involved, but... You left me no choice. In the hubbub, none of the officials or the cameras or the crowd had seen the trajectory of the beam. But Gohan and the Dragon Team did. Those two pale goons had something to do with this. Videl's eyes then suddenly shrank, realizing the pain. She looked horror struck. The pain was building up inside of her and she let out a howl before doubling over with agony. Gohan, without hesitation or question, leapt to her side and carried her off of the ring. Hercule runs to him and is about to give him a lecture, telling him to get away from his daughter, before looking on a vicious expression in Gohan's eyes. It then reminded the champ of the Cell Games again. One thing he could definitely remember was not fake, was that Golden Kid's eyes. They were practically the same as of right now. Get her to a hospital! Now! Gohan shouted. Videl then held Gohan's hand and looked in his face. G Gohan, I'm sorry. Aren't you, Videl? Before fainting, Gohan grits his teeth as Videl, along with Krillin, Hercule, and 18, took the stricken fighter to the medical center. Gohan then spots Popovich getting up and dusting himself off. The announcer then informs the crowd in this unexpected circumstance that since Videl was unable to continue, Spopovich, simply by just getting up on his two legs, 
won by default and would go on to the next round against Gohan. Him being uncertain of her safety in future, he couldn't think of anything else other than making this person Spolovich suffer. Him and his lackey that put his lover's life in danger. Wait, lover? He never got even the chance to tell Videl that he loved her. Everything had been such a whirlwind that he had just simply forgotten to utter those three words, let her know before the tournament in case anything had happened. If she died because of this, he didn't know what he would do. Now this differs from the original since he didn't go to the hospital here and gave Videl the beam. He had no idea in this scenario what would happen to her. It was all a mystery to him. He chose right now to stay and avenge her with fighting. When that battle came around, Gohan wasted no time to utterly devastate Spopovich. Unlike his normal self and being fair, he was cruel. In the original, he relented and stopped before doing massive damage to the fighter, but in the here and now though, letting out his rage in full Super Saiyan, Spopovich was sent careening into the stand, leaving rubble in his wake. Uncertain whether he had actually been killed or not, but Gohan didn't care. It really didn't matter. But yeah, he was barely alive and carted off to the medical center. Yamu realized that his partner was now out of commission, so this made things harder. Still with no word about Fidel's condition, Gohan goes on to fight Kibito and showcases Super Saiyan 2. He is looking around at the others to see what their reactions are as he is doing this and sees something strange. They look calm, like nothing bad had happened. Had they not realized what had just gone down, the seriousness of Videl's condition and situation? She could be dead, or at least seriously hurt, unable to fight again. And to his knowledge, there were no sensu beans to help her in the here and now. The longer they waited, the more she would suffer. All of this got to him. And this guy, Kibito, was not even giving him a fight to distract him. He was just standing there. But then Yamu jumped Gohan, like in the original, and slammed the energy vessel into Gohan, causing him great pain and draining his power. But no Spopovich was there to help pin Gohan down. As a result, the young man was able to push Yamu away before all of his energy was drained, sending the device skittering across the arena out of Yamu's reach. In a fit of blind panic, not wanting the mission to fail, with his friend injured, and now he vulnerable to a similar fate, Yamu flies towards the device, half as full as it were in the original, escaping to grab his friend and heading back to Barbadi's ship. With enough energy to still stand and be functional, Gohan stood there, albeit a little dazed and confused because hey, he had lost quite a bit of energy. His anger had dissipated also, thanks to said drain. He wasn't overflowing with rage right now. Kibito bowed his head. I'm sorry I did not intervene with this predicament, but we needed that to happen. Now we may find out where our charge might be hiding. Please. Allow me to help you heal. Gohan looks uncertain at this, but he could sense a calming aura from this tall white-haired man. He allowed him to do so, and the sensation felt right, much like how Dende would do in the past, but this was even more potent. The dragon team are then met by Shin as the crowd figure out what to do next, and he informs the crowd, the dragon team, about why Spobovich and Yamu were here, and why the latter had attacked Gohan. They were gathering enough energy and life force to try and revive a sinister evil upon the universe named Majin Buu. He himself was the Supreme Kai, Shin, the guy above King Kai, and even the Grand Kai. And this, this flawed Goku, to be meeting such an important person. Shin turned to Goku. I know all about you, Goku. I was hoping to meet you on my homeworld. In much more pleasant circumstances, of course, but we have no time to lose. We must hurry in pursuit. With that, the same posse as in the series, sans Krillin obviously, head off with Shin and Kibito. When Yamu and an injured Spopovich arrive at Barbadi's ship, the wizard is looking unimpressed. He had watched the whole thing go down, but chose to keep a cool expression, acting like he was playing dumb. Well, about time you showed up. Show me the device then. He grabs the device and looks at the reading on it. He was hoping for more. Hmm, disappointing. I was expecting more, you two. What happened? Spopovich then decides to speak for the first time in ages. Master Barberty, we did our best, but those twerps were playing dirty and made our mission much harder than we had anticipated. Yamu decides to roll with this. Yeah, we, we did as much as we could, Master. That energy was straight from a golden warrior. That energy will be dense and amazing for you. It'll be more than enough. Barberty was still not convinced and then decided to break his cover. You lie. They both look surprised. 
Don't you lie to me, the great Barbady. I saw the whole thing. You let a weak human girl get the better of you, you lumbering oaf, he says, his eyes darting to Spovovich, who looks ashamed. And you, his eyes turn to Yamu, you acted like a coward. I would have rather had no energy and you go down valiantly than this. This, he shakes the device. It's cowardice incarnate. I have no use for minions who are not brave and are mightily stupid. He gives them a glare and he causes the pair to contort, swell and ultimately explode. The dragon team watch this from afar and are horrified. This potato headed man was so cruel. As to be expected, said Shin. Babadi is a cold and vicious wizard. We must be careful from here on out. The gang are looking relaxed though, except the Gohan. He was still reeling with how complacent and chill the gang were acting, despite Videl being in critical condition, he thought. Well, yeah, the thing about that, and this is what I'm telling you, is that nobody told him that Videl was okay, actually. She had been given a bean from Krillin because, you know, it's Krillin. And the others would have told Gohan about this, had things not been as frantic and they quickly had to dash off to Barbadi's ship and try and save the world from Majin Buu. As a result, Gohan was keen to take out this being, building anger once more on this potato. However, Barbadi can sense the whole thing, the dragon team waiting in the shadows. He could also sense a lot of anger and vitriol inside one of them. He squints in the direction of Gohan as he sends Deborah to fight the rest of them. That one, if he could produce this much energy in a few seconds, Oh, if I had him on my side, he would make a useful minion. Finally, someone competent. I shall keep my eye on him. As Barbadi was eyeing up Gohan, Deborah had been unleashed on the dragon team, and it still ends up with Piccolo being turned to stone, thanks to the demon Spittle, and Kibito being iced. Shin then starts to realize that they really don't have any choice but to actively take out Barbadi and Deborah. That is something they have to do head on. Him being unaware, of course, of how strong Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan actually were. The Kai is constantly relying on the freezer scale of power. Annoyingly so. Barbadi invites the quartet to try their luck, and the battle begins with Gohan choosing to vent his anger first, more so than in the original, and taking on Pui Pui instead of Vegeta. Goku says it might be better to use rock, paper, scissors to choose who fights who, but Gohan's face is solemn and stern. This isn't the time to be playing games, Dad. We're dealing with monsters here. Fidel, Piccolo, they're all in danger because of me. I have to fix this. Vegeta isn't all that bothered. In fact, he actually finds it quite good as it might get the boy to quell his raging hormones. He is so confused with how Gohan could be so worked up over a girl he just met. He shrugs and just observes the battle. Needless to say, Gohan's smart mind and power is more than enough to deal with Pui Pui. His power is so small in comparison to the hybrid, Gohan didn't even need to power up to Super Saiyan in order to defeat him. The 10 times gravity of Pui Pui's planet, thinking it might be to his advantage, not really much of a problem for Gohan since his time in the room of spirit and time, was far more arduous than this. Vegeta would have actually had no problem with this as he did in the original, but still, Gohan gets the first victory, and they then head on to the next one, the next level, Yakon versus Goku. Whilst that's been going on, Videl had fully recovered from her injuries, and the Sensu Bean had worked his magic. She sat bolt upright in the hospital bed, with the doctors and nurses completely and utterly flabbergasted with her sudden recovery. Even her cure was stunned. Videl, you're alright! I wonder what was in that bean? Krillin walks up to Hercule and explains how sensu beans work and where they come from. Hercule is nonplussed and would normally state that, oh, this was a bunch of hooey, a bunch of tricks and something like a fairy tale. But he had just seen his own child with a gaping hole in her torso and in no mood to sit up, suddenly no longer have a hole and want to sit up. Her wound completely healed. She looked like she'd just woken up after a nice long nap. Completely fine. That was too hard to ignore. Okay, short stack. Even if I do believe you, you and your pals have got explaining to do. Just what is this Gohan doing to my baby girl? Fidel is looking a little irritated. I can answer for myself, Dad. I'm right here. Hercule apologizes, and she explains the training she had done with Gohan, and how they're actually going steady. 
Hercule is totally blown away. His sweet daughter dating some strong man, stronger than him. Dad, I love him. Krillin thought that was cute, and he remembered the first time that 18 had told him that she loved him. Ah, oh, memories. Hercule, though, didn't know what to think. His brain was completely fogged up. But then he remembered something. He actually had a grand final to get back to. He was the defending champion, after all. Well, I gotta go back and fight in the final, sweetie. But promise me this. You stay here, right here, until I get back. We can talk more about this later. With that, he and his agent, who had been tapping her foot madly for the past 10 minutes to get on with it, rush back to the tournament grounds. Krillin and Videl look to each other. There's no way I'm staying here when Gohan is probably having kittens about me. Where did he go? Krillin looks a little more somber than he had been around her cule. Um, Videl? Things have gotten a little more complicated since we got here. Videl looked quite puzzled at this, and Krillin explained the situation from what he could gather from sensing energy. Gohan, Goku, and Vegeta had been battling a huge power, and Piccolo's energy had been frozen solid. Needless to say, I don't think you should get involved. Videl looks a little sore about this. So what am I supposed to do with all this training I've been doing? Sit around and do nothing? Krillin then suggests something else. I don't have the desire to get involved either, but I'm actually curious. How long did you train with Gohan? Fidel counts the time she'd spent with him, and it came up to maybe uh, about a couple of weeks worth of training in total. Krillin was surprised. That quick? And she was already putting out this much energy? Huh. Tell you what. How about we go to the lookout and do a little sparring? Videl nods. Oh, cool. It'd be nice to see Dende again. Wait, you've been there before? Mm-hmm. Gohan and I spent some quality time in that wacky room that slows down time or something. It was fun. Krillin was stunned again. She had some steely resolve to handle even a day inside of that room. Anyway, with them both able to fly, Videl and Krillin sneakily fly out of the hospital room and off to the lookout. Meanwhile, we cut to Barbadi's ship and Goku's battle with Yakon goes as you would expect. But Gohan is getting more and more impatient. He cannot sense energy outside of the ship now at all. They'd gone so low that Barbadi's magical influence was putting a stop to that. And when we get to Deborah's battle, Vegeta steps up and is more than happy to battle this strong fighter, the king of the demon realm. The battle is pretty one-sided with Vegeta having the upper hand the entire time. Deborah is perplexed as to how mortals could have this much strength, unaware of Saiyans specifically and what these Saiyans have been able to do lately, and their prodigious and rapid increase in battle power. He had no answer to Vegeta's vicious blows, and the prince is enjoying this immensely. To think that the underworld had such weaklings for rulers. <laughs> no sport at all. Gohan is getting madder and madder with Vegeta's attitude. He was treating this like some kind of game. It gets to the point where Goku has to step in and ask Gohan exactly what is getting him so worked up. Gohan then lashes out at his father, thinking he was part of the problem, explaining that he's been worried sick about Videl since they left for this mission. Dad, I've no idea about whether she's okay or not, or whether she's still alive. Babidi must be jamming our ability to sense energy. I don't know, but I'm scared. Dad, I'm scared. Scared and angry. I promised to make her stronger, and instead I've just as good as killed her. Goku is trying to console him, and is just about to tell him that Videl was okay, thinking it might make him feel better, but then Vegeta's victory distracts them both. Deborah is defeated, and back up top on the ground level, Piccolo's petrification ceases. The Namekian is really confused as to what happened and what's going on, until he then gets a summons from Dende telepathically to report to the lookout at once. But... The elder Namekian refuses, stating that Gohan's mental state was troubling him. I don't like leading him like this. I'm gonna stay here until I know what's going on. Dende then tries to convince him otherwise, but all he gets is really an earful of shouting from Piccolo. Yeah, Dende, it's probably best that you should leave Piccolo and let him come when he's ready. With that, Piccolo then keeps looking at the front of the ship, waiting for something to happen. Up on the lookout, Videl and Krillin arrive and the latter explains to Dende whether it might be okay to go in the Room of Spirit and Time for a little bit. He wants to train Videl some more, and maybe tie up some loose ends that Gohan didn't have the time to do so earlier. Dende nods and states that since Piccolo had just rejected his request to join them, 
Yeah, this should be no problem. Wait, why do you want to help me? You never explained that. Krillin then turns to her. Kid, I can tell that you've got a lot of potential. I may not be as strong as Gohan these days, but, but I got plenty of experience. At least enough to show you a thing or two about key control. It should mean that what happened to you at the tournament will never happen again. Or at worst, you can at least defend yourself. Fidel nods and agrees that if it hadn't been for her lack of proficiency in that particular area of expertise, she would have progressed. Besides, if you and Gohan are a thing, I really want to get to know you. I've known the little kid since he was yay high. If you like, I can actually tell you some funny stories to help pass the time. He slyly winks, and that makes Fidel chuckle. It's as good as looking at baby pictures for her. With that, Krillin takes Fidel into the Room of Spirit and Time again for a short while, the former telling Dende just to knock on the door if things go south outside. Back below, even if Barbie's influence had dissipated, Videl being in the chamber would have meant that Gohan couldn't sense her anyway, and he wouldn't have known about her going in the chamber again. Barbadi's cursing Deborah's weakness though. He's trying to figure out what to do next. He had no fighters left, and then the energy collected so far, including his minions' efforts, couldn't muster even half of the energy he needed to unlock Majin Buu. He is spitting feathers until he spots something going on on his viewing globe. Bobby, draw your attention to the viewing globe. He could see Gohan shouting with Vegeta. They were standing over Deborah's lifeless form and arguing about something. He pays close attention. I've had just about enough of your immature whining, boy. You've had it easy since we got here. You've not had to lift a finger. And no, that weakling you fought earlier doesn't count. Goku and Shin are trying to stop the bickering from happening, but Gohan is getting more and more irate with Vegeta. You were toying with Deborah, wasting valuable time. You always do this, Vegeta. Play with your food. Vegeta snaps. Gohan had probably nearly almost pressed the Goku button. Watch yourself, boy. We may be on the same side, but nobody, nobody tells me what to do. Barbody is licking his lips. That boy, he's getting wilder and wilder by the second. <laughs> I knew it. He would make the perfect candidate. His youthful figure is just what I need to release Majin Buu. Oh, love makes people do crazy things. <laughs> Barbody begins to work his magic, as the two Saiyans are still bickering. Meanwhile, Krillin and Videl are training in the room, and have been doing so for the best part of a few days inside. Videl already had the building blocks of key control in place, but she hadn't had time to put them all together, as it were. With Krillin's simple instruction, though, she had managed to get some headway into understanding how key manipulation worked, when a knock on the door ceased their training at once. Krillin, assuming that things were really going south outside, opened the door, but instead of Dende frantically telling him something was wrong, he was facing a taller Namekian. It was Piccolo. P piccolo You're alright! He said nothing for a moment, though. Ah, uh, you okay there, buddy? Krillin asked. Krillin. Could you step out for a second? I want to see what that girl can do. What about Gohan? Is he okay? It'll only take a moment. He pushes past Krillin, knocking him out, and the door slams shut behind them. Krillin, absolutely confused as to what the heck happened there. The Dell sees the tall green man she had spotted earlier talking to the short, spiky-haired man. So, you're Videl, huh? Piccolo muttered. Y yeah she said confusedly. Hmm. Gohan thinks highly of you, and you're capable of getting stronger. He takes off his cape and weighted clothing. More silence. I'll be the judge of that. With the door slammed behind them, Piccolo and Videl are looking at each other, with a deep sense of foreboding coming from the latter. Time had, quite frankly, stood still, and no longer did she have the same enthusiastic and kind face of Krillin to look for for assurance. Instead, all she had to look at was looking upwards, at the seven foot tall big green man staring back at her. The look on his face was that of pure skepticism. He was really not sure about this one. In his mind, he could tell that she did have some potential better than the average human, and he knew that Gohan had trusted her completely and without question, but he couldn't let her know that. That was a sign of weakness in his mind. He needed to see more, and whilst things had seemingly calmed down outside for the moment, 
he could maybe use this silent space to see what she was made of exactly. So, Gohan seems to have faith in you, about your ability as a fighter. Videl tries to calm down, but her stiff posture and lack of height immediately put her on the back foot without her even knowing it. Y yeah Piccolo grunts. Can you say more than just, yeah? It does not help your case in my eyes. If you're intimidated by me just standing here, then we have no more business here. This is a waste of time. The Dell's inner fire flared up at that jibe. Hey, give me a chance. Huh, so you can say more than one word. Good. Go on. Why should I give you a chance? The Dell stood tall and began to explain. All my life, I felt like there's something missing. Sure, my dad is the strongest guy in the world. Piccolo scoffs at this, which emboldens Fidel to continue. But I feel like his style of fighting just doesn't sit well with me. It made me lose focus, and I doubted myself because of it. I shut myself up from the world, and mostly I gave off a negative aura to my peers. Nobody would really talk to me. My status as the champ's daughter made sure I wasn't picked on, but I kind of wish I was. Just for some kind of interaction, you know? All I got from those wimps at high school was lip service. They're scared of me. So I went on to think, what's the point of friends? They're just there when it suits them. They can't be honest with me without fear of reprisal, then they're not real friends. That is until Gohan showed up. He's different. Piccolo nods. You're quite right there. Gohan is unlike any other person that I've known. He motions for Del to carry on with a small smile forming on his stern face. Gohan's not afraid of anything, even if he is a total dork. He didn't walk away from me, and he chose to push back, give me something to work with. He had the balls to test me, and then show me things I've never seen in my entire life. I want more. I've never felt so alive, Piccolo. I'm ready. Piccolo stood still for a moment before relaxing. You know, I'll be honest with you. You're far more eager than Gohan was when I first taught him. He wouldn't stop crying about not wanting to fight. Granted, he was only four at the time, but I feel like I can work with you. So, tell me, what did Krillin teach you before I got here? The doll told Piccolo that Krillin had been filling in the gaps about her understanding of key control, and she then started to breathe more slowly, mustering up some key to show Piccolo. He then looked serious for a moment. Not bad. Seems like the short stack has ensured that what happened to you won't happen again. Fidel, feeling quite happy at this, then does some hand motions. You see, I wanted to learn something Gohan was trying to show me, but since my key control wasn't all that great at the time, we sort of moved on. It was something like this. She raises her arms above her head and placed them so it looked like she was maybe trying to catch a softball right above her head. Piccolo's eyes widened. This was the Masenko. <laughs> Gohan must really think highly of you. Huh? Why's that? That was the first technique he ever learned. Really? She looked up at her hands. Whoa. You're in luck. He learned that technique from me. Wait. She then recalled from what Gohan had told her that Piccolo was his first master. In all of the whirlwind of the past few weeks, her learning how to fly and maybe understand key in some way, and martial arts, she had forgotten that. Right here though, she was standing next to Gohan's master, the source of his potential and power. It's an honor to meet you, Mr. Piccolo. Piccolo waved that aside. Relax, kiddo. You don't need to do any of that. Let's get started. We don't have much time. We don't? I get the feeling that whatever attacked Gohan is just the beginning of our troubles. We then cut to Barbadi's ship, and Piccolo was indeed correct. This was just the beginning. Gohan was getting more and more livid, and Vegeta was not helping when it came to calming him down. Goku was fighting a losing battle, and the argument was only getting more and more fired up. Kakarot, control your son! If I have to hear him mewling about his girlfriend any longer, then I may do something I regret. She's probably out there having ice cream or something. What is that supposed to mean, Vegeta? Goku, not the most tactful of souls, then remembers what he was about to say earlier. Oh yeah, I've been meaning to tell you, son. Krillin had some senzu beans ready in case we needed it during the tournament. That we may have gone a little bit too far. Now that I think about it, he most likely gave one to the Dell. Uh, huh? 
You mean? Yeah, uh huh? Nods Goku. She's fine. I could sense her when we got here. Her energy's back to normal. He pats Gohan's shoulder, but he shrugs it off. This might have been the right thing to say an hour ago. You mean to tell me that you both knew this the whole time? The whole time? And you didn't tell me? He rounded on Shin. Did you know this too? Shin, looking very apprehensive, nervously nodded. Gohan walked backwards and tried to contain his boiling anger. But Gohan, aren't you glad that she's all right? That's not the point, he said with a scary monotone. You didn't tell me. You let me go through all this turmoil. And you could have just told me at any moment. Instead, you made me think she was dead. When all this time she was up and about and completely fine. You put me through that. All of you. Vegeta scoffed. You put yourself through that. Surely you should have sensed her energy stabilize. Gohan stopped and thought. Yeah. Yeah, he actually should have done. Now he was angry at himself. Barbary's time had come. Gohan was completely wide open. Parada papa! His influence immediately leapt on Gohan's confusion, frustration, and raging hormones. Gohan doubled back with pain, and Shin immediately realized what was occurring. Oh no! Goku urgently tried to snap Gohan out of it, but Gohan was deaf to the world. He screamed out, and on his forehead appeared an M symbol. Barbary's control was complete. Excellent! Now I can put this teenager to good use. Gohan! Use that power of yours for something worthy of my praise. Eliminate those fools. Gohan's writhing ceased, and his eyes set squarely on Vegeta. Goku and Shin were left merely as spectators. All right, Vegeta. If you think you're all that, let's do it. I want to fight you. Vegeta's ears perked up, not interested in the fact that Gohan had, you know, been possessed by the enemy. That's the first smart thing you said all day, boy. You got me curious. Very well. Vegeta gets into position. Shin looks to Goku. Goku, you have to stop this. Gohan's mind has been controlled by Barbadi. You need to incapacitate him before he reassures Buu's resurrection. Goku is left lost for words. I, I, I can't, Supreme Kai. I can't hurt my son. Vegeta laughs. <laughs> Interesting move, Barbadi. Wherever it is you're hiding, you've made it squarely a one-on-one -on -one match. Just the way I like it. Leave it to me, Kakarot. I'll set your boy straight. Barbadi then transports Vegeta and Gohan far away from Goku and Shin so that they cannot interfere. And then just to make doubly sure, transports the two of them to a faraway planet. That should keep those fools busy. Now, Gohan, show me what you've got. Now, one good thing has come about from this. Since Gohan's ire was fixed squarely on Vegeta, the people back at the tournament are spared a fiery demise, instead witnessing the victory of Hercule at the hands of Android 18. As that's been going on as well, Videl and Piccolo has spent a couple of days in the chamber honing the Masenko to the point where she can actually use it. It's not all that powerful though, but she can at least generate sparks and do some kind of attack. Get the basics down. Piccolo is satisfied with this for the moment, but he's interrupted by a knock on the door. Mr. Popo opening the door and informing the pair that things have gone south. Badly. With the bridge to Earth re-established, Gohan's malicious energy washes over Piccolo and Videl. She could sense energy very, very basically, but given the time she had spent with Gohan, it was enough to realize his energy aura, and it had changed for the worse. She is horrified. Go gohan What happened? Piccolo places a hand on her shoulder. This is bad. I can't even sense Goku. What's Vegeta doing? As those two are processing this, Goku and Shin are stuck on an alien world, unsure where they are. Goku is cursing himself for not telling Gohan sooner about Videl's condition, as well as Vegeta's unwillingness to help Gohan relax. It had all fallen apart just when they were about to stop Barbary. Damn it! I've got no idea where we are, and it's hard to get an energy read. He's trying to instant transmit wherever he can, looking around everywhere. But the sudden teleportation and lack of knowledge of their surroundings is making the job much harder than it should be. Oh, that's a Yodratian technique, isn't it? Goku stops and looks at Shin, shrugging. Yeah? Why do you ask? Well, it's impressive and all, but it's got nothing on we Supreme Kais can do. Shin smiles, feeling he actually contribute for once. 
Don't worry, Goku. I can get us back in no time. Shin grabs Goku's hand and uses instantaneous movement to bring them back to Earth. When they've returned, the battle is in full force, and both Gohan and Vegeta were in Super Saiyan 2, sparking with immense ferocity. Gohan's power had not reduced since Gohan and Shin were flung out into space, and Vegeta's energy, whilst lower, was absolutely radiant with intensity. Like, he was enjoying this. Goku wanted to power up and get involved, but Shin grabbed him. We can't risk that, Goku. Your time here is limited, and if you power up too fast, you'll only use up your remaining time here. We need you. Shin points to Goku's halo, and Goku remembers that he only had one day left on Earth. He is looking to the battle and is trying to hold himself back. Barbody can sense that Goku and Shin have returned, but he isn't all that bothered. He can actually see his gauge and machines reading that the energy labels were increasing, almost to 75%. Even the wizard was amazed by this sudden jump in energy in just a few minutes. I had no idea that such young ones could produce this much energy. I've missed a trick all these years, but... No matter. Soon, I will no longer stress about such trivialities. Boo will soon be under my command. Goku is trying to think of something, but then senses Videl for the first time in a while. Maybe she might be able to calm Gohan down. With a sudden motion, he transmits to the lookout, surprising Shin, spotting Piccolo and Videl. No time to explain. Videl, I need your help. He reaches out a hand to Videl. Piccolo looks aghast. Goku, what do you think you're doing? You can't just hurl her in the middle of a battle! No! I can't let you do this! Think straight, Goku! From what I can gather, it's too late anyway. Vegeta's got what he wanted. Whatever that monster Barbadi wants, too. Piccolo turns away, and Goku can sense that in that moment that he had left, Barbadi had come to the surface with something. And the energy reading was increasing. 85%. Goku looks to Videl with a serious expression. Wait here. He transmits away. Videl surprised by that technique. This... Does Gohan know that too? No, but he's right. Stay here. I need to go help Gohan. I'll make sure he doesn't get hurt. With that, Videl is left behind. But not for long. She flies behind Piccolo, to which the Namekian consents and turns around. He actually sort of knew that that would happen. He could see her fiery expression, and despite having difficulty with the rush of air in her eyes, she was coming with, whether he liked it or not. He smiled. <laughs> She really does believe in him. The gauge now reads 95% and Barbadi is absolutely ecstatic with the progress. And he could literally feel himself losing his cool out of sheer glee. Come on, come on! Just a little more primitive squabbling and my goal will be reached! Vegeta and Gohan were sizing each other up again, with Goku and Shin unable to think of anything to get them to stop. That is until Piccolo and Videl show up! When Piccolo lands next to Shin and Goku, he apologizes for being late, and for the sloppy showing earlier, which led to him being turned to stone. Shin brushes it aside, saying that Deborah had been taken care of, so no problem there. But these Saiyans were making things much harder than they need be. Piccolo then looks to Gohan, and feels utter contempt. He let his emotions get the better of him. I didn't teach him to be so weak. He seemed angry, but on the inside, the Namekian was really distraught, seeing his dear friend being consumed from within. Videl, meanwhile, had no idea what was going on. Uh, Goku? Why is Gohan fighting Vegeta? Goku turns to her, looking seriously at her, and also disappointed that she ignored his order to stay at the lookout. He's being controlled by a wizard named Barbadi. It's causing him to fight against us. I'll provide energy to release an even greater enemy. Shin picks up the flow. Majin Buu is a menace that had plagued our universe many millions of years ago. I thought we had managed to stop him from being released all that time ago, but I fear that we're too late. Babidi nearly has enough energy to release him. Videl looks to Gohan, and instead of being upset or emotional, she's actually kind of annoyed at him. Hey, Gohan! All three of the people around her look horrified. What was she doing? Drawing the attention of Majin Gohan to them and to her! Vegeta is ready to lunge forward once more. Snap out of it! Shouts Videl from a distance. This is his chance. Gohan is distracted and gets slammed in the cheek by Vegeta, causing him to collapse in a heap on the ground. As he's trying to get up, wanting to get his own back at the prince, Gohan then turns to where Goku and Shin were and sees Videl. Up and about, right there in front of him. The... the... Del... you're here. Why? He muttered to himself. Babadi looks a little nervously at the battle. What is this? 
Why have they stopped fighting? Gohan's eyes, once piercing daggers, relaxed a little. He got up, and Vegeta turned to see where he was looking at. He could see the girl right there. She's about to get herself killed. What a fool. <laughs> They're as bad as each other. He crosses his arms and waits to see how this would pan out, ready to act if Gohan turned foul again. Very ready to do so. Gohan stands up and walks slowly over to Videl, still in Super Saiyan 2. When he gets close to Videl, his face relaxes even further. Here she was. A okay? Barbody is getting furious, about to intervene, but Piccolo then grabs his arm. That's about enough from you, Barbody. That is for getting the better of me earlier. How dare you! You should know better than to try and hoodwink me, the great Barbody! Let's go, or I'll... Piccolo squeezes his wrist, and the wizard cries out in agony. What, cry even louder? I can live with that. Barbady is concerned. Videl, despite being apprehensive at the sight of her partner looking absolutely beaten up and villainous, reaches her hand out and grabs his. It's okay, Gohan. I'm okay. I'm here for you. I'm ready. You're... all right. She nods in affirmation. Gohan's eyes close, and he begins to recall... Mr. Piccolo's meditation techniques, not the napping ones, there is a difference. His mind calms, and he's able to get a handle on his consciousness. The thing that let Barbary in is gradually diminishing. The wizard could feel his influence weakening, and Piccolo being there, he couldn't reinforce it. Love. The thing that gave him the chance to control Gohan before was now the thing that was pushing him out again. This sickening emotion. I don't understand it. Piccolo smirks. I don't get it much myself, but I do understand its power and what it can do in the right hands. You're done, Bobbity. It's over. Bobbity thinks for a second. The big green was right. It was over. For now, using all his wily tactics, he gives up control of Gohan, blinds Piccolo with his magic, and vanishes from view. He was gone, and so was the margin symbol on Gohan's forehead. He powers down to his base form and collapses to the floor. The Dell catches him, and they embrace. Shin looks jubilant. Did we do it? Where's Barbary? I can't tell where he is. He looks around, and no, nope, not a trace of him. Nor can any of the gang sense him. Hmm. Either he got snuffed out by Piccolo, or he's hiding his presence. As Gohan and Videl are reconciling, as well as having a cheeky little kiss, sharing their mutual relief for each other's safety, Piccolo returns to the side of Shin and Goku and shares his thoughts. That little twerp must have fled. I almost had him, but he was too quick for me with his blasted magic. Shin asks him if Barbary had enough energy to release Boo, and the Namekian shakes his head. From what I could hear from his constant rambling, no. We had about 5% left. Shin looks happy. Good. If we can find him right away, then we can stop him from reaching his goal. We can save the universe! He turns to see if the others agree to this idea. They do not. Well, isn't anyone going to start looking for him? Still silence. It's not as easy as that, Supreme Kai. Even if Bobbity is defeated, who's to say another mad person comes along and finishes what he started? We need to let Boo be released and then destroy him. That way, he's gone for good. Shin is horrified at this idea. What? Goku, you can't be serious. I have seen firsthand his destruction. I've lost many of my companions thanks to his terrifying power. How are you this calm? I gather that you're powerful and all, but he's way stronger than Frieza. Everybody's stronger than Frieza these days. Once I agree with Kakarot, let Boo show up. I'm curious myself to see how strong this monster is. Shin is feeling utterly ganged up on. These cursed Saiyans. Why did he have to be so beholden to them right now with Margin Boo? Piccolo then delivers some reason to the table. Listen, if Barbary is in hiding, then this means we've been granted some valuable time to prepare. There's no way that he would dare go after any of us anymore. Not directly. He'd be wiped out in an instant. Odds are he'll probably be looking for scraps of energy from regular people, like Cell did. That'll take him days. That's more than enough time. Shin couldn't believe how callous they are being, so careless. Letting regular civilians be absorbed to Barbadi's madness? Gohan, now having gathered himself a little, tells Shin that there is a way that there's a method in this madness. They have Dragon Balls on Earth. They can wish back anyone whose life force has been consumed by Boo. They'll be okay in the end. 
Shin is still perturbed by these foolhardy tactics, but hey, at least there's a plan. Sure enough, Barbadi's plan was to gather energy from regular people. With his energy syringe ready and the location of Boo's seal ball cloaked, he set about his mission. As he was going about his business, he could not believe that he was actually being allowed to do so. Those heroes were letting him release Margin Boo seemingly. I never imagined these oaks would simply roll out the red carpet like this, inviting me to release Margin Boo with no resistance. Oh, I've waited so long. I can wait a little longer. Besides, he enjoyed lording it up over weaklings and one by one, humans were being absorbed into the syringe and the gauge crept up agonizingly slowly. But Barbady didn't mind. The dragon team, now gathered up on the lookout, were not sure how much time they had left before Boo would show up. And so they decided to quickly lay down the foundations of their battle plan. Goku realizes that his time left on Earth would be limited and he probably won't be able to reliably stay for the main encounter. If he used his secret weapon, only known to him at the moment, Super Saiyan 3, it might be too much to sustain his presence on Earth, and it might lead to him being prematurely departed from this world. No, he had to use his time wisely. As the rest of the gang are gathering their bearings, Gohan and Vegeta are having a couple of sensu beans from Krillin, Goku talking to Piccolo, explaining about something that he meant to tell the others earlier, something he picked up in the other world, fusion. It's a really powerful technique. In case my time runs out, I want you to fully understand it, Piccolo. You're one of the smartest guys I know. I'm sure you can pick it up in no time. Piccolo nods and together they go over the basics. When the time comes for Goku to leave, he thanks everyone for their hard work. He gives Goten and Gohan a big hug and tells Chi Chi not to worry. He'll be watching over. I gotta pass the torch someday. Now seems as good a time as any. Gohan, you got this. He gives a thumbs up and with that, Goku and Baba depart for the other world. Videl, after all this time, is completely blown away with what she's seen. Fusion, Super Saiyan, Ki, superhuman powers, wizards. This was crazy. As Goku vanishes, Shin informs the gang that he too must go, looking very tired. There's not much more I can do here, seeing as you've all decided the outcome for me. I feel that Goku's work though isn't done yet. And just in case Boo is too powerful for any of you, I'm gonna go and find Goku in the other world and train him with a legendary weapon. Something that I know that nobody has yet wielded successfully. But I feel that Goku might be the one to finally do it. Another reason he was going was because the stress of being close to where Majin Buu might appear was too much to handle right now. He wanted to skip town. He disappears from view and is off to find Goku and of course show him the Z sword, not Gohan. Videl then asks Gohan what they can do with this remaining time. Maybe they could go in the room of spirit and time again. She can show him her gains with Krillin and Piccolo and develop on them from there. Gohan thinks it's a decent idea, but they need to improve even faster now. The chamber might not be enough. And this is when Vegeta says his piece. That alone won't work. The chamber is useful, but what you need requires even more intense training. He tosses Gohan a capsule. Take this. It's a portable gravity chamber. Bulma gave it to me in case I ever needed it if I was off world. I want that back when you're done, by the way. By the way, the other reason she made it was to get Vegeta to shut up about training so much. Would they be responsible this time around? Yeah, I think they would be. But Masako, why? You said the last time that Gohan considered a whole day in there, they chose not to spend that just because due to their teenage antics and all. I mean, that's very true, but this time around, it's quite different. First off, they have a major threat to the planet to deal with. And second, quite frankly, they're not in the mood. They have a pressing engagement to deal with that being Boo. But okay, due to the fact that Gohan got a little bit nervous, they spent six months in there. But during that time, as well as the gravity chamber inside the room of spirit and time, it's devoid of any dangerous acts of intimacy. But that doesn't mean they can't cuddle or anything or kiss. They just need to sob, uh fully sampling the lemon grove, if you know what I mean. When they emerge, Fidel's power has increased drastically. Her pixie cut looking wilder than ever, and her muscle tone looking even more defined than ever as well. She never felt better in all her life. She felt invincible. Gohan had benefited too. As Fidel's power grew, her effectiveness as a sparring partner became more and more apparent. Gohan's power had meant that all the 
softness that he accrued in the past seven years from not training had been negated. And in fact, he had slightly increased his power from then. And you know, it's kind of like a snowball effect. So the stronger Videl gets, the more effective Gohan's training gets, and in turn that gets improved with Videl and so forth. They have both made a promise to each other too. If they get out of this whole thing in one piece, they'd get married. It had become very clear in that six months that they were truly made for each other. They fit one another perfectly. Gohan needed a tough and yet conscientious teammate to push him forward, and Videl needed somebody sincere and thoughtful to provide her comfort and stability, something she'd been lacking. As they did emerge, Vegeta immediately took back the capsule containing the gravity chamber and went inside. But Dende warned him that he was very close to using up his total allotted time inside. The Guardian told Vegeta that he would knock on the door when his time was nearly up, or else he might be stuck inside. Piccolo takes note of this fact. If we weren't so in need of his power, I wouldn't mind him being stuck in there for all eternity. Could use some peace and quiet. Gohan and Videl then sit back and relax as Piccolo is teaching the boys the art of fusion, but they're struggling to get to grips with it. Krillin and 18 sit down by the couple and inform them that while they were gone, 18 had gotten to the final of the tournament, only to lose to Hercule. Not bad, I suppose, 18 says. He was too good. You still get decent prize money for coming second. Videl looks to her and looks unconvinced. Dad totally bribed you, didn't he? 18 looks taken aback. Huh? What makes you so sure, kid? I know my dad. He's wanted this glory for so long. He would do anything to keep it that way. I love him, I really do, but I also know that you would kick his ass if you actually went all out. 18 was kind of impressed. Hmm, not bad. What's your name again? Videl. What's yours? 18. I feel like we're gonna get along just fine. Back on Earth, three days have passed since Barbady fled. He now returns to his ship and places the last remains of energy in the sealed ball base. He looks tired. He looks frantic, but also triumphant. At last, these fools will rule the day they let me slip through their fingers. Now, arise, Martin Boo! The sealed ball lights up with energy and within seconds, it cracks open. A pink cloud emerges from within and it then forms Margin Boo. Sure enough, Barbadi is elated to see Margin Boo out and about. However, he didn't prepare for the childish behavior this magical genie exhibited. All this creature was doing right now, instead of destroying stuff, was jumping about and chuckling to himself. Was it playing? Barbadi was trying to keep his cool, but it was no good. He had no idea how to handle such immature antics. Meanwhile, as he was trying to reason with the beast, Hercule had arrived on the scene. W w why is he here? Well, you seriously think that Barbadi's reign of terror had gone unnoticed by the general public, as well as Jimmy Firecracker of ZTV? With the now double world champion and defeater of perfect cell around, the people of Earth had charged him to go and confront Barbadi and bring his reign of tyranny to an end and save more people from being consumed by his voracious lust for power and human souls. Who kills the champ right now? He took on cell. This should be easy. He's a little potato. I mean, Hercule couldn't say no to more plaudits and glory. But now he wished he could. From what he could gather, Videl was not harmed in the crossfire of all of this, so he felt a little better about it. But he still would prefer not to be doing this, though. He then spots Margin Boo. But since he can't sense energy, his read on the pink blob based on first impressions is very misguided. What the? Why is the potato wizard screaming at that baby dude? Anyway, he's distracted. <sighs> Time to get this over with. He steps out and marches towards the pair. Hey, you, Barbadi! Your days end here! Barbadi and Boo turn to see Hercule, with the latter giggling to himself. <laughs> oh, that? He look funny! Hercule is taken aback, but does his best to keep it together. At least what that thing said wasn't evil or anything. I have just about enough of you, wizard. Return from where you came from, or else I'll have no choice but to stop you. Barbadi is nonplussed, but then smirks. I'm surprised that I missed your energy. You're as strong as ten humans. Would have saved me a little time suffering from your life force, but no matter. Boo, eliminate this wretch. Hercule then contorts his face into a very emotive look of terror, to which Boo finds utterly hilarious. 
Boo is rolling on the ground with mirth and is laughing hysterically. <laughs> Big Mouth <Man> Funny! <laughs> concentrate, Boo! Concentrate! Kill him! Now! Boo stops laughing and then looks to Barbity with an evil expression. Me no like you! He swats Barbity out of the way, which badly injures the wizard. As he gets up from the dirt, he is cursing under his breath. How did his father Bibbidi find this so easy? Boo then turns to Hercule and points at him. You're funny. Me, Boo. What's your name? Oh, uh, Hercule, thinking he could talk his way out of fighting his moron, tells him his name. Oh, you want to play with Boo? Play? What kind of play do you have in mind? Boo shrugs. I don't know. Just play. Uh, I guess we could play. Boo is elated. He claps his hands and jumps on the spot, happy to find someone to entertain him. Unlike that little angry man, a friend. Barbady though has had enough. He is about to use his magic to control Boo's mind, but he is then stomped on by a white boot. He looks up to spot Vegeta looming over him. Going somewhere, little fry? Vegeta! Uh, thank goodness you're here! And that thing over there, I need your help to control him! Vegeta smiles. Oh? What makes you think I would help you? Having trouble with your little toy then? Don't worry, I'll fix him for you. Uh, you will? Bobbity looking hopeful. Indeed! I'll have him visit you in hell! Vegeta point blank blasts Bobbity into pieces. With that little oaf out of the picture, Vegeta's focus was now squarely on Boo. He was keen to test his might on this freak. Hercule then spots Vegeta, the small dude from the tournament, and with Boo distracted, he then takes this chance to get to safety and hide. As far as he was concerned, Barbadi was gone, and that's what people wanted him to do. That guy will stop the pink dude, and nobody asked him to stop that thing, so bonus? What then follows is basically the Margin Vegeta fight versus Boo, only Vegeta not being a Margin. But before the fight begins though, Vegeta is looking very enticed with the challenge ahead of him. As far as I'm concerned, you're going to be my substitute punching bag, you pig freak. Boo tilts his head, not understanding the phrase. Vegeta, keen to take his anger out on Boo, now having lost his chance seemingly to beat Kakarot. Now here lies the rub. Vegeta's power is now the same of Margin Vegeta's, but even that is not enough. It soon becomes clear that he cannot win against Boo, despite his extra training. He is unable to win the day right now. What he can do though, is to try and get a read on Boo's power. He can tell after facing Gohan earlier, and now facing Boo, that the latter is way stronger than anyone. If Gohan fought him next, even with that training with Videl, Gohan would lose, and thusly, so would everyone else. Vegeta, for the first time since losing Trunks to Cell, admits that He's taken everything for granted. He has no choice but to sacrifice himself. He comes to terms with this surprisingly quickly, understanding and actually regretting that he can no longer stay here and be with his family. At the same time, he comes to his own conclusions with his obsession with Kakarot, that he had taken all the best things in life trivially. He had been obsessed. Goten and Trunks show up like before, trying to help Vegeta, but it still plays out the same as the original. Trunks is knocked out after Vegeta telling him how proud he is of him and instructs Goten to go back to the lookout for further training as well as his safety. With that, Vegeta powers up everything he has before detonating. Kakarot, I'll be seeing you soon. The final explosion is engaged and Boo is consumed in the energy. When the smoke clears, Vegeta's petrified remains crash to the floor and Boo has reformed with barely any signs of damage. He's simply walking around, having had a little play session. Hercule watched the whole thing go down and had to admit that that Vegeta was pretty brave, but the monster was still there. He thought he could run away, but then Boo called out to the funny man, realizing he was still there. And now Hercule realizing it was either death later or death now potentially. He stepped forward and introduced himself, using all of his resolve to stay put and talk Boo out of killing anyone. He decided to make fun of Barbadie, to which Boo found amusing, and that endeared him to Hercule. That whole thing then plays out like the original. Even the 
whole Van Zant thing, but we'll get to that in a bit. As Goten arrived back at the lookout with an unconscious Trunks, the gang are all aware of Vegeta's act, and they are looking quite ashen-faced. With Goku gone, and now Vegeta too, it was all on Gohan's shoulders, and he was extremely nervous, but the Dell used this time to tell him that he was doing great, and that from what she could see training with him, he could achieve anything if he put his mind to it. That helped a little, but also a little peck on the cheek helped him even more. Gohan felt very bashful, and Chi Chi, who had been transported to the lookout for safety earlier, enjoyed this heartwarming scene amongst the chaos. Maybe this Videl wasn't so bad after all. Someone who could take care of Gohan in his old age when she was gone. With Gohan, Krillin and Piccolo helping out Goten and Trunks with fusion as best as they could, they couldn't sense Boo coming after them, or even getting near the lookout. And Videl and 18 watch on as the boys train together. They use this time to observe Fusion and how silly it looked. But speaking of silly, 18 comments on why Hercule acted that way and why was he so in need to be admired. I don't get it. Why are you so proud of him? To me, he seems like a really bad father. Utterly full of himself. Videl, feeling a little prickly, retorts. Well, what about your parents? 18 looks back and suddenly feels the need to look at the floor, muttering her reply. I... I, I don't really know. The doll looks serious. I see. Every parent's different. I know to you it may seem like my dad's lousy, but I understand him. He's done the best he could after my mother died giving birth to me. He never resented me. He never regretted my existence. He did everything in his power to provide a home for me. For us. To make mom happy wherever she is. He's a bit of a goofball, sure. But I wouldn't have it any other way. 18 takes this in. Huh. Interesting. You know what? You're kind of cool. I can see why my husband thinks so highly of you. Videl blushes a little. Really? Yeah. He and Gohan think you got some potential. To be honest, I I kind of want to see it for myself. Do, do you fight too? Not really. I'm not as into martial arts as the others are, but I know the formal stuff. I basically lived at Krillin's master's place for years and watched them train. As much as I get why he's into it, I prefer a more go-with-the-flow style of fighting. Street fighting. That's my jam. Videl's eyes light up. 18 was a brawler like her. They chant some more. Videl getting a very big sister vibe from the droid. Hey, is 18 your actual name? Well, sort of. But my original name was something else. I think it was Lazuli or something? From what Krillin told me when he found Durell's old blueprints. But I don't really gel with it anymore. So call me 18, would you? Videl nods, but it was cool to know her real name. Lazuli. Me. Say, while the boys are going at it, why don't we go for a whirl? Says Videl, to which 18 nods. Sure, why not? It's better than sitting around waiting for something to happen. They begin to spar. As they're enjoying this killing of time, Videl suddenly spots that Goten and Trunks are getting angry, flustered, and not quite getting the technique. Piccolo is aggravated also. This fusion is so annoying. The boys push back at Piccolo at not providing a means to calm down this quirk. Gohan is too nice to Goten, to which this gets to Trunks, who is now still really understandably sore after losing his father just now, on a short fuse, you might say. Videl chooses to step in and use her youthful attitude to get through to the kids. And sure, the kids have fused correctly. But Videl realizes through her own experience of training that the kids aren't truly ready yet to use fusion to its fullest. Piccolo can't see what she sees, what with him not being human and all. Videl notices Trunks' personality as amplifying Gotenks' negative traits. So instead of being told off any more for not getting it, Videl tells Goten how much Gohan is counting on him and how he needs to step up and be careful when they're fused. Goten promises to be more determined and to make his brother proud, liking the idea that he thinks so highly of him, as does his girlfriend, which makes Videl glow beet red. She then takes Trunks aside and mellows him out too, knowing how hard it is to lose a parent. Granted, she lost her mother at birth, but her advice was enough to ease Trunks' furrowed brow for the moment. As a result, when they fuse again, Gotenks is now less arrogant and abrasive. I think we all like that. Goten's half being able to hold the reins of Trunks' half. Piccolo is further impressed with Videl. I don't know what you did, but thank you. 
was going mad. Gohan pats the Dell on the shoulder. Koten really likes you. I can tell. The Dell gives Gohan the thumbs up. Not just a pretty face. Gohan blushes a little. Meanwhile, Hercule and Boo have gotten very friendly, and Boo's house as well as the stray dog Bee have come into both of their lives. Boo is quite happy in his pajamas, reading Bob and Margaret, a book that Hercule had gotten for him, and Hercule was just idly scratching Bee's head, liking this relaxed tone. The fighter couldn't believe his luck. He'd actually done something without relying on taking someone else's credit. He had genuinely convinced Boo not to kill anyone and he had to be honest with himself. He kind of liked this Boo. Sure, he was like a little kid, but it sort of reminded him of the Dell whenever she had a tantrum, when she got what she wanted and was happy. Watching the genie casually read his book, he felt happy. Good, good Boo. B yawned and went outside for a comfort break. Then a gunshot fired. Both Boo and Hercule rushed outside to find Van Zant cheering at his prize. B wounded on the floor. Boo rushed over, stunned into silence, trying to wake B up, but he was motionless. Now he too was motionless, steam rising from his top. He is able to heal B though, but after that, he was dead to the world. The cloud appears above him and evil Boo assumes control to merge into Super Boo, killing the guys who wounded B. Good. He's about to attack B and Hercule, but stops and instead turns his attention to the top of the heavens. Don't get in Boo's way. Run. He flies off, leaving Hercule and B to themselves. On the lookout, the mood changes. Boo is on his way and arrives minutes later. Before Dende could knock on the door to the Room of Spirit in time to alert Piccolo, Gohan and the kids who have just gone in, Boo is here and proceeds to take his anger out as well as his impatience on the Dragon Team members present. He turns everyone bar the Dell, Dende, Krillin and 18 into food items and either eats them up or completely crushes them. When he is about to get to Videl, his eyes widen and he can sense her energy. It was similar to her cules. This must be his daughter that he was talking about. Videl. In that sudden hesitation, Videl lunges forward and attacks Boo with all of her strength. She is surprised that Boo is not fighting back. He's just taking these punches and kicks. He is being hurt, albeit very, very fractionally, but he doesn't retaliate. Instead, his mouth is grimacing more and more, almost as if the part of Mr. Boo inside of him is holding him back. When it becomes clear he is about to boil over though, Videl tells Aitin and Krillin to get off of the lookout, to which they do. Videl then fires a Masenko at point blank range, and it's enough to cause Boo to stagger backwards, being temporarily blinded. When his sight comes back seconds later, Videl is gone. He could go after her, sure, but he can sense Dende behind him. Green man, where is strong fighter? I felt stronger fighters a second ago. Show me, or Boo kill everyone on this planet. He stretches his hand upwards to show that he was serious. Dende, not wanting any more humans to suffer, points to the door of the Room of Spirit in time, to which Boo cautiously enters. But then when he does, he gets blasted by Gotenks, Piccolo and Gohan, as well as destroying the door behind them. They are all trapped. With this going down on Earth, we cut to Goku in Otherworld, making his way to the main port of call he has, King Kai's place. However, the king is busy talking to someone. When Goku lands on the planet, he is stunned to see who it is. L Vegeta? What are you doing here? Vegeta swings around and appears astonished. Kakarot! Hey, Vegeta. How did you get to keep your body? Ponders Goku. King Kai nods, knowing the answer. I thought the same thing when he showed up here. But apparently, Vegeta's recent redemption and willingness to sacrifice himself for the greater good of mankind was barely enough to tip the odds in his favor. And trust me, King Yama, he really wanted to send him to hell. But... But... <laughs> you, you, you tell him, Vegeta. Vegeta smirks. I asked him about Raditz, and I made the comment that his hair reminded me of a pineapple. It made him laugh, and so, well, here I am. King Kai slaps his knee with mirth. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good ripper. I didn't think Saiyans could be so hilarious. Vegeta and Goku, though, looked very keen to train together right now. If they were to spend eternity together, 
they could get really strong. That is until Shin shows up. He hails King Kai, to which the king bows with respect. Hey Shin, what's up? Goku, I need you to come with me. I've got something to show you on my home world. It might be of use to you concerning Majin Buu. I fear things have gotten worse back on Earth. But Supreme Kai, I can't go back. You know, my, my time's up. I'm aware of that, but please, come with me. I'll explain more when we get there. Vegeta coughs, as if to remind Shin that he was there too. Whatever thing you have to show Kakarot, you can show me too. Shin looks pained and sighs. Oh, fine, you can come too. Grab my hand. With that, Shin teleports Goku and Vegeta off to the sacred world of the Kais. King Kai sighs himself with relief. Ah, oh, thank goodness! I thought I was going to have to repair a lot of things today. Good thing I don't have to. He then turns back to his house and closes the door. Back on Earth, Videl, Krillin, and 18 are hiding both themselves as well as their power levels. Well, 18 doesn't need to since she doesn't give off key. They were told earlier as part of the plan to get off of the lookout in case things go bad and await further instructions. Little did Videl know that Gohan had basically sealed himself away forever in another dimension. She was spared that chestnut of the prospect of never seeing her partner ever again. For now, all they could do was wait to see what could happen next. Both Krillin and 18 were impressed with Videl's performance and bravery. How did he know he wouldn't fight you? I don't know. I just saw that he wasn't attacking me and so I chose to make the most of it. I can't really explain it any better. Out of the way, kid, 18 says looking at her with pride. You did good. We can at least live a little longer to help out in any way. Yeah, says Fidel with a somber air to her voice. But the others, though, they weren't so lucky. It's okay, Fidel. We have a means to bring them back good as new. Dragon Balls. He then explains how the Dragon Balls work in detail, and that makes Fidel feel a little better. Back in the Rim of Spirit and Time, it plays out as you would expect. Boo is absolutely apoplectic at being trapped inside this dimension against his will, as well as being dominated by a little kid. Gotenks, having attained a mysterious new form of Super Saiyan, Goku had never shown enough, but had explained about it in a new form of Super Saiyan 3, to which it was far greater in power than even Gohan's Super Saiyan 2. Both Gohan and Piccolo felt confident that this transformation could finish off Boo, and then maybe they could find another way to get out of this dimension. But then Boo screams at full pelt in desperation, and that rips a hole in space-time like you know. He escapes and takes out his anger with beam after beam down on the ground. Using that same trick, Gotenk screams out, and the others fall out and back into reality. Seconds later though, Gotenks defuses due to the massive power drain of Super Saiyan 3. Gohan exclaims, Huh? What? But, but it hasn't been 30 minutes yet! Piccolo curses, it was barely five. Goku never told us that Super Saiyan could drain the time limit so quickly. <sighs> it's useless. Goten and Trunks felt very sad to have defused, but at least they were home again. But then the pain of souls snuffed out echo through their minds. They had to find another way to stop Boo now. Down below, Krillin could sense this happen, the defusing of Gotenks, and cowered with fear. Uh, uh, th this is not good. They're separated again! Aitin Videl turn to him and audibly gasp. Now what do they do? Fusion had failed! Or had it? Videl puts two and two together. Say, Aitin, do you remember how to fuse? Aitin shrugs. I guess. We did spend hours watching those kids do it. Why? Well, why don't we give it a shot? Aitin looks quizzically at her. For real? You think it will make any difference? Well, one thing's for sure. I can't stand waiting here to die. Honestly, I'd rather go out like I came in, screaming and kicking. 18 pauses for a second. Good point. Let's do it. Krillin is surprised to think that it will work and that Videl could be that close to 18 in terms of power already. Well, I think what you need to remember here, and this is what I'm going on, is that 18 does not produce key. So her power level, thanks to the Infinity Engine, is quite versatile. And also, Videl's gotten much stronger thanks to the better training of Gohan. So, yeah, I'm gonna go with this. Anyway, they can sense Boo getting close, and this is their time. They decide to fuse. Boo can sense a huge power flare up below him, and without hesitation, speeds towards it. When he arrives, he is greeted by not two people, but one. Enter the fusion of Videl and Lazuli. 
visually. As Krillin can see, she is visually spectacular. All about the name puns on the Master Collects channel. You can't get mad at me, because Toriyama did it too! Now, you might be able to immediately suspect that this fusion is still not enough to beat Super Boo, and yeah, you would be right. She is incredibly powerful, much greater than the sum of her parts, individually, but it is not enough to outdo Gotenks. That being said, we do have an interesting opportunity to explore what a fusion involving an Infinity Engine can do. Visually, eyes up Boo, and is keen not to run away this time. Weird. Boo sensed a weak power here, but now power much bigger. Have you been hiding from Boo? Where is Videl? She's, She's right, right here. here. She splays her arms out to show herself. Boo tilts his head in confusion. But Videl doesn't have yellow hair. Visually punches Boo in the face and it catches him off guard. Boo gets sent into the dirt and it is enough to shake the ground below. Krillin is amazed at this. That lack of response is like with Videl earlier, solely. Had that trait of Boo having issues fighting back carried over in this fusion? Visually lands on the ground and rests her hand on her hip as if she was massively bored. 18's brazen dominance ringing out here. I may not be as strong as you big guy, but I can give you what you crave. Now stop sleeping on the job and let's do this. She gets into a fighting stance. Gohan stance, Videl contributed here. And Boo lets out a scream of anger. You dare taunt Boo! He surges forward and the fight begins. Boo does have the upper hand over Visually, but much to Boo's surprise, she does not get tired. She just keeps going. Whatever the Infinity Engine contributed to this fusion, it meant that this fusion did not tire, nor did her extra power cut down the time limit. They were going to be going for the full 30 minutes at full charge. So yeah, you can consider this battle as the halftime entertainment. Visually knew that she could keep Boo occupied long enough for Gotenks to tank back in. As that's been going on, Goku and Vegeta have been told about the legendary Z-Sword, the thing that might be enough to stop Margin Boo. Goku had been doing his best to wield it, but he was getting more and more impatient, not really seeing the point of a weapon. In a fit of rage, Goku resorted to the transformation he never got to use on Earth, and this shocked Vegeta. Super Saiyan 3. The form could definitely carry the sword and was flailing it around getting used to the feel. Vegeta is dumbfounded. What? You've been hiding this from us, Kakarot? Why didn't you use this against Majin Buu? I needn't have taken my own life. Goku pauses. It's not as easy as that, Vegeta. If I'd have used this, it would have drained my energy within a couple of minutes. Here it can last a little longer, since I'm not tied to a mortal body. It works differently here for some reason. Shin nods and confirms that that is the case. You can push harder here since your body wasn't entirely physical. At least in the traditional sense. Vegeta does take note of this though. But the sword breaks, like in the original. And the Elder Kai thanks them for his freedom. He then offers to train Goku in a special technique to which piques Goku's interest. It first involves sitting down and concentrating for 25 hours. Goku nods, not really thinking anything of this thinking back to his time training on Yardrat. That involved a lot of sitting down, assuming that this was more of the same, and then the main training would come about later, so this was just the beginning. 25 hours pass, and this is where Goku realizes he's probably made the biggest mistake of his lives. He has become ultimate Goku. There was no more training after this. But why would this be a bad thing? Goku's now at his full potential. Well, you see, that's the point. Goku's now at his true maximum potential ever. In terms of his skill set and talent, he can't get any more powerful, like with Gohan. With Gohan, though, that didn't really matter as much, since he didn't care to get any stronger after that, thinking what he had would be enough, and then he could call it a day. As for Goku... Oh... That's probably the biggest oof you can think of in Dragon Ball. You know how much Goku hates handouts, and now on top of that, he can't get any stronger and pushes limits. To the Saiyan, this is a disaster. When the Elder Kai is done explaining that Super Saiyan is no longer necessary, this bums Goku out immensely, and then that low morale turns to anger. He screams out to the heavens and burns off excess energy, which of course now is limitless, so that was a fruitless exercise. Vegeta is left stood on the spot. He could tell Goku got stronger, sure, but he too could understand the remorse that Goku must be experiencing right now. 
He was actually showing some sort of empathy. The chance to get stronger has been taken away from him. I must admit, as a Saiyan, this is probably the worst thing that could happen to him. After he had vented as much as he could, Goku lay down on the ground, contemplating his lot. Shin sits by him and asks what's wrong. You don't get it. I've got nothing to aim for anymore. All my life I've sought stronger opponents, and to get stronger once I had beaten them, never stopping. If you and what your masters say is true, then that can never be. I peeked. Shin thinks for a moment. Is there anything else I can do for you? To help? Goku looks to him, still looking serious. Can you use your influence to get me back to Earth? I want to have something to let off my steam against. That person being Majin Buu. This power should be enough to stop him. He sighs a little. Shin thinks, not sure what to do. This is my fault, Goku! Pipes up the Elder Kai. I didn't realize that this would remove you of your greatest passion. It was entirely selfish of me not to explain properly. I wish to make it up to you. He gets up and in one move, he gives his life force to bring Goku back to life. Consider us even. He gives a thumbs up and Goku feels a little bit better. Back on Earth with Buu distracted, Dende communicates to Bulma that this is the right time to use the Dragon Balls. Since they hadn't been used earlier to clean up Margin Vegeta's mess, which of course never happened, Bulma could gather them quickly with the help of Yamcha, Tenshinhan, and Chiaotzu. When they had managed to gather them in record time and summon Shenron, they used the first wish to bring back those who were killed by Majin Buu and Barbadi. Suddenly, millions of people are revived, including Vegeta, who notices in the other world his halo was gone. In that moment, Shin realizes something. This is a chance to do something. They're both alive again. Goku, Vegeta, grab my hand. It's time to do something about Buu. Now's our chance. Goku nods, as does the prince, and together they make their way back to Earth through the art of instantaneous movement. In the minutes before though, Gotenks had arrived to stop Buu. Vizuli could sense Gotenks arrive in the nick of time and nodded. Hey, Pink Belly, your old friend's dropping in. Uh, what do you mean? Gotenks lands a double kick in the back, and this sends Buu into the dirt, just like Vizuli had done earlier, making similar entrances, but only this time with feet. Gotenks makes his presence known, as per usual, and thanks Vizuli for her hard work. She slinks off and in the rubble next to Krillin, they diffuse in the nick of time. As they pant heavily from the exhaustion, 18 looks to Videl and smiles. <laughs> that was fun. We should do it again sometime. Videl and her fist bump. Right on. I told you you could do it. They turn their gaze to Gotenks, Videl eating up the last bean that Krillin had had on him. He began to fight Boo, Gotenks, albeit just with regular Super Saiyan for the moment. After a few minutes, it was clear that this would not work ultimately. They could not beat him in that form. And so, he had gone Super Saiyan 3 and was beating Boo. But Krillin could tell that despite their slight bump in power since the last time they fused, the power drain was still there. That part hadn't really been fixed. It was barely any longer seemingly than before. Ugh, this isn't going to be the thing to stop him. Come on, boys! Focus! He was right. Boo could tell that the fusion had a time limit. He may not talk properly, but Boo was still a very smart and shrewd creature. He just had to wait it out seemingly. He knew about the fusion thing. This kid would break apart at any moment, he knew it. Krillin turns to 18 and Videl, thinking that maybe they could fuse again should the need arise. In theory, they need an hour to cool down before trying again to the stamina drain. That is on paper. But 18 thinks about something, wondering that her infinity engine might negate that since she doesn't feel tired at all. And Videl, she just eaten the sensu bean and regained her energy. Well, Videl looks nervously. We could try in a pinch, but I hate to think what might happen if we break the rules here. Who knows what we might turn into? 18 shudders, but is willing to try it as a last resort. That prospect is looking more and more likely though, as Gotenks is getting more and more frantic, knowing their time was coming up, they could feel it. But then Goku and Vegeta show up, and with a double punch, they take down Boo and begin to fight, going in all guns blazing. In the hubbub, Gotenks does defuse. Boo smirks. Gotcha! He pulls out a tendril from his body and grabs hold of the boys, pulling them in and absorbing them when they're at their most vulnerable. Something he hadn't shown off yet. He could absorb people. Before they knew what happened, Boo had now gotten stronger, taking on characteristics of Goten and Trunks, looking slightly more human. 18 Videl nod, 
they gotta go for it. They fuse into the Zuli and leap forward. I got you now, Boo! But Boo, with his back to them, merely mutters, No, you. He turns his head slightly, and more tendrils appear from his back and catch Vizuli pulling her in as well. This power was stronger than the two boys combined, and as a result, Vizuli's influence dominated this version of Super Boo. Vibuli, you could say. This feminine looking Boo now stared down at Goku and Vegeta. Come on now! You wanna fight? You got one. Show me what you've got. Ultimate Goku was more than happy to do so, rising up to meet Vibuli. I don't particularly care for your tactics, Boo, but quite frankly, I don't really care about much right now. I want to let off some steam, and you're in my way. He gets into his stance, and the pair of them fight. Ultimate Goku is, sure enough, when he's actually putting his mind to it, more than powerful enough to deal with this Super Boo, or Bibuli, depends what you want to call her. But like with Ultimate Gohan, his cockiness was off the charts. Vegeta had noted this, and was very unnerved by this version of Kakarot. This isn't like him at all. He's more like a typical Saiyan. It's like his own essence has been snuffed out of existence. I don't know what to think about this. Meanwhile, Shin feels safe enough to escape his hiding spot and runs up to Vegeta with the next part of his plan, telling him to take one of his earrings. We may need this soon. Put this on your left ear, Vegeta. There's no time to explain. Vegeta initially seems angry to even entertain this, but right now, all this change in Kakarot was enough to make him feel more compliant. It didn't sit well with him at all, Kakarot acting this way. Goku had now slammed Boo into the ground, and the genie was having trouble getting up. Shin used this time to teleport to the Saiyan. Goku, take this earring. We can use this to finally stop Boo. By putting it on, you confuse with Vegeta, and that should be more than enough to win. Goku then looks to Shin unconvinced. I don't need it. This power will do. Besides, I kind of want to take all the credit in killing this thing. Shin looked really nervous now. This sudden loss of hidden potential really got to Goku. It had changed him into a relentless and somber fighter. Boo hadn't gotten up still, so Goku goes closer to see what's taking him so long. He is now standing on the ground, and this was Boo's chance. He collapses the ground around Goku, He's now stuck in pink quicksand. Technically, it's more like a pool of boo. A pool? He cannot escape, and as he is flailing around trying to break free, the earring he was holding flies out of his hand and onto the ground. Gohan and Piccolo arrive, only to see Goku drowning in boo, and a new buku emerge. Shin scrambles around the ground, finding the earring just about, and gives it to Gohan, the last rational person he can think of. Gohan, put this on your right ear. No time to explain. Gohan is confused, but he can tell what Shin is saying is serious. When his eyes are set on Buku, his eyes widen. Gohan can feel Videl's key in there. Had she been absorbed? He looks sternly and puts the earring on, wanting to help. Without realizing, he is suddenly drawn towards Vegeta. The prince too could feel his body being dragged by some unknown force towards Gohan. He couldn't stop it. In a flash of light, they collide, and out of the light emerges the Patara fusion known as Vegahan. This goes about as you might expect, except Gohan is part of this fusion instead of Goku, it's not Vegito. This fusion is now just as strong as Vegito and is, like Shin suggested, dominating Buku. In the end though, the same thing occurs with Vegahan planning to let Bu absorb him to then rescue his friends, and most importantly Videl. But before that though, we want to actually stew around a bit. Buku is having trouble reforming as quickly as before, and this time around Vegahan, thanks to Gohan's influence, considers about maybe just to hell with the plan, wiping this being out of existence. They could wish back their friends with the Dragon Balls, it'd be fine, but something was stopping him from doing so. It was too easy. They then are absorbed, and after a while of hovering around Buu's innards looking for their allies, the pair defuse. Vegeta was utterly perplexed as to what happened, as was Gohan. Did you have any part to play in this ridiculous display, boy? Gohan, who didn't want another argument with the prince, remembering what happened last time, pleaded his innocence, but the prince wasn't buying it. Gohan takes the earrings back from Vegeta, making sure he didn't break them, and promises to give them back to Shin, never to use them again. Vegeta scoffs, but 
is keen to get on with proceedings now they were here, maybe tricking Boo when he wasn't looking. As you probably may know, Boo was aware of their presence eventually, and used his internals to stop them before reaching the part of his body which contained the sacks with their friends inside. They then read Good Boo's mind and find out about the past origins of this version of Boo, and Vegeta considers maybe freeing this iteration of Boo as well. Gohan tells him not to bother, but Vegeta is getting tired of taking orders from this kid. This makes Gohan though, who had been carrying the sacks with Videl, 18 Goten trunks and his father, to place them down, looking viciously at Vegeta. We do not have time for this! Vegeta flinches slightly. He hadn't seen that expression on Gohan's face since the Cell Games. If you keep railing against me, I will not hesitate in killing you. Again. Vegeta looks seriously for a moment and grunts. We are here to rescue our friends. We have no ties with that one. Now put it down. Help me carry these or else I'll leave you behind to rot. You got that. More silence before Vegeta smirks. Hm. Well played, Runt. Maybe we'll make a Saiyan warrior out of you yet. They ultimately leave Mr. Boo inside. They then do escape with the quintet, and Boo can feel his body reverting back to his Super Boo form. When he gets his bearing, Boo spots Gohan and Vegeta staring back at him. You still got those trinkets, kid? I don't mind having a little fun right now. Gohan tosses him the earring, and they fuse into Vegehan once more. Boo tries to grab the Patara, but misses. Gohan was too fast. They combine again, and quickly evaporate Boo with a final Kamehameha. Boo was done. When Videl comes to, she sees Gohan standing over her. You okay? Videl nods and gets up on her own accord. Yeah, I'm fine. That was weird being absorbed like that. But did you see me in 18 Fuse? I could do it! I've never felt so strong! Gohan smiles and they high five. That's great, Videl! This is just a start. I've got plenty more to teach you. One day, you might be strong enough to face me as a Super Saiyan. What makes you think I can't do that right now? She raises her eyebrows. They laugh and embrace. Soon they return to West City, and Hercule is reunited with Videl, her being a little too lax in her key control and almost squeezing her father into two. As she apologizes, they realize that Shinron was still there. He had been very patient waiting for the second wish. Please state your wish. I'm getting oh so tired. They still don't have a wish though to think of, but Hercule then has an idea. You guys, I don't think it was right for you to not rescue Mr. Boo. He may have been part of that monster that killed people, but not that version of Boo. I could tell that he was a good person. I know that. Please, if you can, bring him back to life. The gang are resistant. But then Shin backs up Hercule does have a point. They look to Shin with surprise. That part of Boo is made up of my former master, the Grand Supreme Kai. Gohan and Vegeta then recall the memories they had read from Good Boo. He was telling the truth. Well, of course he would be. I mean, Shin was there. I feel it'll be okay to let him live, so long as you, Mr. Hercule, take responsibility. Hercule nods with enthusiasm, and so the wish is made. To tie up another loose end, Goku arrives back at Mount Palzu, and Chi Chi is happy to see him in one piece, and now back to life. However, Goku is looking quite serious and sincere. Listen, Chi Chi, I realized something while I was in Otherworld again. I've been really selfish over the years. This floors Chi Chi into silence. Goku continues. Something happened, which means I can't get any stronger. I plateaued. At first I was upset about it, but you know what? I've been giving it some thought. Just because I can't get any stronger, doesn't mean I can't help out. Gigi thinks, and this is a really eye-opening moment for her. You're right. You can do good around here, no matter how strong you are. You have no idea how much I've missed you, Goku. Even if you don't think you're the best or strongest anymore, you're still the best to me. You can become the best husband, the best father, and the best man you can possibly be. Not a Saiyan, a man. It clicks with Goku. She was right. This didn't have to be the end. This could be the start of a whole new chapter. Goku nods and smiles. You got it, Chi Chi. I love you. Gohan and Fidel were now very much known to be a solid couple at Orange Star High School. 
People weren't expecting such a couple to form though. Videl, the hard-nosed daughter of the Great Hercule who seemed to not really like anyone, now pairing up with Gohan? This transfer student who was a dork and far too muscular given his bookworm demeanor? Oh, the confused stereotypes and conceptions of teenagers. How I don't miss that day. With this difference from the original though, Videl was absolutely pumped after her ability to actually help the Dragon Team with their efforts against Margin Buu. Even though her and 18 were absorbed by Buu ultimately and unable to help, they had been able to hold the fort as Vizuli long enough for the likes of the Saiyans to be able to step in and finish the job. They had actually contributed a lot. They had been able to do a lot of good for Earth and she felt like a hero and admittedly more of a hero than her father ever could be. However, she never chose to rub that in his face as it were. I mean, what good would it do? No, no, no. It was best to let that sleeping dog lay where it was. It was better for Hercule's peace of mind. Nevertheless though, the itch to do good for humanity failed to go away. On many days when she and Gohan were studying, there would be moments where she would groan from sheer boredom at just doing homework. Ah, uh, Gohan, this isn't what we should be doing. We should be out there in space or kicking something's ass. Not here looking at books. Gohan would, every single time, being incredibly patient with his girlfriend, state that an education is just as valuable as strength. But of course, that's before he learnt about conferences. Yeah, I do understand that you're not the studying type, honey. But we gotta make sure you get the grades needed to graduate. Once that's over with, we can do more fun stuff, yeah? Fidel was curious. Like what? Gohan wasn't expecting to answer that, so he stumbled goofily. Well, uh, maybe you could, uh, well, I don't really know off the top of my head. Ha! I managed to stump you, the unstumpable Gohan! She lightly punched his upper arm jovially. Just then, Gohan's Saiyaman communicator went off. A report of a major bank robbery was in progress. Gohan stood up, ready to deal with the call to action and deal with it. Then he saw Videl banging her head against the desk. Man, he really hated seeing her this down. He understood that after the highs of battle a few weeks ago, doing menial studying for her was a major bore fest. So he had an idea. Tell you what, Videl, why don't you come out on this job with me? Huh? You mean fight crime? Yeah, I have a spare costume in the closet. It may be a little bit big for you, but it should work for now. Videl's face lit up, just like he thought it would. She immediately rushed to the closet across the room, stripped down and changed into the suit. Whilst Gohan was in the room, she was that excited not to notice. His face was beet red and he frantically turned around out of respect. Gohan, please, it's not like you've not seen it before, she said this rolling her eyes, but Gohan still gulped. Still though, it's, it's not right. <sighs> You're such a dork. With the Dell now changed into her costume, the pair set off for the crime scene and got the job done with the greatest of speed, the Dell having a blast doing so. After this fracas, the news got around about the Great Saiyan Man having a sidekick. They dubbed this accomplice the Great Saiyan Man 2. The Dell scoffed at the thoroughly unoriginal name, but hey, it's better than maybe the Great Saiyan Woman or something. As far as the media were concerned, they were equals, as they both showed great power at the same ability. And Gohan did agree that the name sounded all right and it actually sounded kind of cool. Like there was some sort of squadron or something. You know, Great Saiyan Man 1, 2, 3. It's like those Super Sentai shows he used to watch. And unbeknownst to Videl, it reminded him of the Ginyu Force back in the day. With this compromise now reached, Videl and Gohan dedicated their spare time to crime, fighting on the condition that Videl would study to get the results needed to graduate with the proper grades. Granted, she wasn't exactly dumb or anything like that, but she really wasn't geared to educational pursuits, academic stuff and the like. She had the smarts, but she never applied herself as much as she could have, just deciding to coast, as had been the case since preschool. But then they had an unexpected visitor from the sacred world of the Kais, arriving with a very particularly special invitation. Meanwhile, Vegeta had been sort of left in the doldrums. Now he and Goku were alive again, he had been left looking for someone to train with aside from Trunks. Trunks in the meantime though had changed for the better. Thanks to Videl's assurances during their fusion training, he felt more composed and less bratty than the original story. As a result, 
his training with his father was more focused and he felt like he had made some progress, as well as impress his old man perhaps. Vegeta did have to admit that Gohan's woman had knocked some sense into his son. He had been getting quite spoiled and bratty lately, so this did the world of good. Honestly, Bulma Mori coddles him too much. Maybe now he could become more of a man. Still though, Trunks' power was not enough to cure him of his hankering for a good battle. Gohan had made his position clear that he wanted to focus on school and now seemingly doing odd jobs for the police in the city. It meant that Vegeta's main yardstick was occupied. You would think that he would go and train with Goku and that's what he wanted to do. But unfortunately, that's just not possible anymore. His old rival had made it clear many times, but that wasn't enough to stop the prince from trying. Every single other day, maybe one day Goku would relent. After all, he had remarkable power now that was just itching to be tested. This ultimate power could not be beat. But one day though, it did come to a head. Vegeta had arrived at Mount Paozu, as per usual, and Chi Chi getting very bored of seeing Vegeta stomping his way to the front door, asking the same old thing time and time again. Vegeta, I keep telling you, he's not interested. I want to hear that from the clown himself, woman. Chi Chi scowled at him and looked down at the prince when she got right up in his grill. For the last time, I have a name, you short stack. Either you call me Chi Chi, or you can forget about coming here ever again. You got that? Vegeta grunted and looked away, but then spotted Kakarot playing with Goten and made a hasty retreat from the scary human lady. Hoping Vegeta was here for a social call this time, sighed when the prince made it clear, again, his desire to fight him. Look, Vegeta, I keep telling you. You sound like your woman, Kakarot. But Goku ignored this. I'm not into that stuff anymore. I plateaued. I can't get any stronger than I am now. I've made my bed though, come to terms with it. I'm okay with it, Vegeta. What's that supposed to mean? Are you chickening out of a duel? What I'm saying is, Vegeta, I can't give you the fight that you want. You want something where we go all out and cause all sorts of mayhem and courage and stuff. I'm just not wired like that anymore. I've changed. I don't have the spark anymore. You'd be better off fighting Gohan, you know. That one is all busy being lovey-dovey. He's been slacking since Majin Buu was defeated. He's no use to me right now until he catches up. He just told me he was off to train with the Supreme Kai. I think he's gonna go and do the same ritual thing I did. Interesting. Fine. You keep telling yourself that you quit, Kakarot. The time will come where you will be back in the game, whether you like it or not. And I'll be ready for you. With that, Vegeta flew off waiting for Gohan's return. Goten was confused as to why Vegeta was so angry. Trunks surely is good enough to train with dad. Why is he so mad about Gohan not doing enough? I don't know, son. You're okay with our training, right? Goten beamed. Of course! I feel like I'm making progress, sure. We don't have to do it all day or anything. What we got is cool. Goku smiled. Good. So what do you want to play next? With that, the two Son men had more fun playing together happy with their lot. And as we just mentioned, Gohan and Videl had been summoned by Shin to the sacred world of the Kais. For their services in stopping Barbadi and eliminating Majin Buu's evil side, they were granted special training with himself and the elder Kai. Gohan asked whether they could perhaps receive the same training that his father had had, that ritual, and Videl obviously wanting whatever Gohan got so she wasn't left behind. However, the elder Kai was now reluctant to do so, your father was so mad afterwards. I don't know whether this power is right for you, my child. I don't want you to blow up like he did. I can't deal with the stress these days with you whippersnappers. Don't worry, Elder Kai. I know what I'm getting myself into. We both do. We're honored that we're even being considered for such a power. We're ready for it. Are you sure? You won't be able to go Super Saiyan and your power will peak. Is that what you want? Gohan nodded, as did Videl. The Elder Kai sighed and relented. First, Gohan and then Videl undertook the ritual. However, at the start of Videl's training, the Kai did get a little bit lechy at the woman's figure as she rested there, but after a couple of arm locks from the woman, the Elder Deity was put in his place. Gohan apologized for her behavior, but Shin quietly said, Quite frankly, he needs to understand that that sort of thing is not right, Gohan. He's very set in his ways, I'm afraid. Gohan nervously laughed. Relating, Master Roshi-wise. Afterwards, Videl didn't really notice any difference. That is until Gohan told her to power up as much as she could. 
Thinking this was a weird way to show off power, the amount of energy she could omit was far beyond what she'd ever felt before. Even the power of the Zuli was dwarfed by this change in strength. She felt buzzed, more so than ever. Oh, wait till I show AT you this. She's gonna be so stoked. The Elder Kai reminded them both that it was very important to keep training as much as they could so as to not lose this power, as it was very sensitive to that kind of thing. It was possible for this to occur if it was left forlorn for too long. The Dell accepted this fully. Well, Gohan, looks like we have to train more if we want to stay this strong. <laughs> she was dancing on the spot with how good she felt, whereas Gohan sighed. How is he going to get her to study now? Now, this is where we're going to be doing something different. With this four year time skip, we have the ability to add the 13th movie into the mix. Yes, we're going to be adding the Harudagan movie, but of course, with a twist of what we've done so far in the story. We start this arc some months after Boo, and both Videl and Gohan have settled into using their unlocked potential, their ultimate power. Videl has just about scraped through the end of year exams with a passing grade, which Gohan had to settle for, but all this was pushed aside, of course, when the likes of Hoi came into their lives. After saving this weird creature from chucking himself off a great height, he presents them the music box as a gift, like before, and the group struggle to open it. Once they use Shenron to unlock it, Tapion is released, as is the beast known as Rudigan, as well as his essence. Tapion is angry at Gohan's decision to open this box so foolhardily and makes a retreat but Trunks is still intrigued with this very interesting and cool-looking individual. And thanks to Trunks being more level-headed in this story, his relationship with Tapion is much more amiable, more grounded, more mature. The Guardian of Urudagan, liking this Trunks even more, comparing him to his little brother ever more so than in the movie. When it comes to Hurudagan's lower half escaping the first time out, Gohan and Videl, thanks to their unlocked potential, are able to fend off the Kaiju before Tapion can use his ocarina, which fascinates the protector. He is fascinated with this pair's power and asks where it came from. This interests him greatly. Maybe there's more to this planet than I first thought. However, despite Bulma's effort to build a bedroom-sized music box for him, it isn't enough to calm him down, and the full kaiju is let loose upon the city and with Hoi reveling in the destruction. Vegeta now steps in, demanding to know why Kakarot hasn't shown up to help, but nobody actually knows why. <sighs> He can't be serious! Why is he being so reckless with Earth? Goten, who had been visiting Trunks during this, steps up and explains. Dad isn't worried about this thing. He knows that we can take this monster on without his help. He believes in us, Vegeta. But Vegeta is sickened by this decision and decides to do his best and smack this creature down, only to be smacked down himself. Super Saiyan 3 Gotenks is enough to, like in the movie, incapacitate the first form Kaiju but then we get the cicada form, which is no match for Gotenks and he sent flying. Gotenks is able to do a little bit of damage to this form, but the fusion breaks before they can get a good rhythm going and finish it off. Trunks curses this turn of events, but Tapion, who had been watching the whole thing, praises him for doing his best against that hideous creature. I've got a feeling we might be able to stop Hoi and Arudagon after all these years. We can't lose hope now, Trunks! Trunks nods and pays attention to the efforts of Ultimate Gohan and Videl they could finish it off. In this version, Tapion doesn't need Trunks to get involved with the sword, and it also means that the ocarina is intact as the duo step in. Ultimate Gohan, who had been training all this time, is now at the level of Super Saiyan Blue, we reckon. His mentality to this form is different to that of his father. Instead of seeing this as a limiter, Gohan saw it from another angle thanks to his smarts, as something like a booster. He could never tire, as was the same as Videl. Granted, the latter's power wasn't as high as her boyfriend's, no, but she was now slightly stronger than Krillin and on course to get to Piccolo's level of power if she kept refining this technique. In this form, Gohan felt that maybe his father could get stronger if he got out of his funk, but he also didn't want to disrupt something that he knew that his father was enjoying. He was actually happy. So why change that? Why spoil it? They had a monster to stop and in their full Saiyaman regalia, the duo did a full power Super Kamehameha at the same time, which was just about enough to destroy Harudagan, leaving Hoi utterly speechless. Now, fearing for his life, he tries to flee the scene, but then gets accosted by Trunks and Tapion, who knock him to the ground, and the latter uses his now intact ocarina to seal Hoi away in the music box, never to be released again.
Tapion collapses to the ground and sighs with relief. After all this time, it was over. But now what? In the original, Tapion used the time machine to go back in time to his home planet to stop everything that took place. But this time around, he doesn't have that option. Since we're including this story in the main timeline, Bulma doesn't have access to the time machine. She had forgotten about it until late in Super in the Goku Black arc. That's the only change we feel like making from the movie, so that means that the warrior remains on Earth. And besides, he is now, having seen all this power, keen to learn more about this planet and what it can offer, as well as its fighters. In the time he spends here, he takes a shine with Piccolo, meditating with one another for many days at a time. The Namekian taking a very big liking to this individual, who was very keen to settle his furrowed brow after all the centuries of toil. This does mean that Tapion doesn't live at Capture Corporate Trunks, we felt that was a little bit surreal and silly, but he still remains friends with the young lad. But instead, Piccolo has another idea. I think I have just the place for you. Come with me. Piccolo then takes him to the lookout and introduces him to Dende. Dende, this is Tapion. I believe he might be of use for you. Huh? In what way, Piccolo? Piccolo then explains to the Guardian, in a very honest manner, that Dende, he's no fighter. He is more of a passive observer, with more of a defensive slate of abilities. He clearly needs a warrior to stand by him at the lookout at all times in case of trouble. A Templar, if you would. Tapion bows his head, honoured to be conversing with this god of earth effectively. I promise you, your grace. I will give my life to defending this world I now call home. Dende laughs awkwardly. <laughs> Gosh, you can call me Dende, my friend. I don't take well to the idea of being a deity yet. I'm still sort of new to this thing, but yes, I'd be delighted to accept you as an assistant. Piccolo smiles. Hmm, <laughs> good. The thought of you lazing about a Bulma's place didn't sit well with me. You'll get more out of life here with Dende and Mr. Popo than there. Tapion nods and thanks Piccolo for his help. Hmm, I shall do what I can to protect Earth. With that, Piccolo flies off, leaving Tapion to get acquainted with his new home. It had been 18 months since Margin Boo had been defeated, and Bedell had successfully graduated from high school. She had just about scraped through the grades required to pass and get her degree, thanks to Gohan studying with her, giving her the right motivation to prevent her from coasting off the coattails of her father's riches and flunking out of high school, of course. Gohan assured her that this would be important for her life going forward, even if she didn't have to rely on it all the time. It's a symbol of your progression and a personal achievement, honey. You should take pride in that. Videl though scoffed, taking no pride in it at all, stating that she had no intention of getting a boring job or anything like that. Not nah, Gohan. I want to open up some kind of dojo or something. I mean, Dad's not going to be at the top of his game for forever, you know. I want to make use of this power in some way that's constructive. Maybe make a buck or two. Gohan pondered this for a moment. He wasn't sure whether this mindset was wise or constructive. And also, she kind of needed good grace to understand accounts, math, logistics, how she would build a dojo in the first place, dealing with customers, clients and all that. But he was getting ahead of himself. He felt that he shouldn't be too heavy handed with the Dell's aspirations. He didn't want to crush them. If she wanted to give this a try, the best that he could do is just be there for her in the good and the bad. But then that reminded him of something. Hey, Videl, remember the promise that we made back on the lookout? Videl looked nonplussed, which made Gohan a little sad. Oh, I thought you might. It was quite a big deal. I was kind of looking forward to asking you, but I, I guess if you forgot, then... Videl then kissed Gohan on the lips. Of course I remember, you dummy. It's just things have been so wild as of late, there's not been the time to do anything about it. But you're right, Gohan. Let's do it. Gohan beamed at this. She had remembered. They embraced. The wedding was spectacular, laid on with the help and gift of Capsule Corp. The dragon team gathered to celebrate this special day. The one blubbing the most, of course, was Hercule. <laughs> I can't believe my baby girl's getting married. Oh, so young. She is the most beautiful angel that I've ever seen. You better not mess around with her, Gohan. Remember who her daddy is. Videl laughed. Oh, I know who my daddy is. Right, Gohan? Gohan blushed the most he had ever done in his life. Hercule eyed him up suspiciously. Well, well, good. Uh, I guess. And yes, my friends, Piccolo did blink in the wedding photo. 
like in the original. Goku and Chi Chi were there watching the happy couple dance the night away, and they were in a pretty good place with one another. They had had a good couple of years thus far with Goku not getting involved with the fighting on Earth directly, and it had also helped him gain a new look on life. Granted, he still liked to train with Goten and improve his skills, Chi Chi didn't deny him that basic need, but he also appreciated the quieter things of life living around Mount Palzu, like tending to the farmland, relaxing with his family, as well as taking time to just fly around Earth, explore its wonders. Remembering the good old days when he was younger of the mystical adventures that he had with his friends. It helped him relax, come to terms with his power, what he had already. Despite the fact that Gohan and Videl had proved that this unlocking of potential could lead to some sort of gains, for Goku though, this power had affected him differently to them. He was happy, content, satisfied. I guess this technique is different strokes for different folks, I think. After the wedding, Videl had taken some time to relax, now she didn't have to worry about school, doing some personal training, as well as figuring out the style of combat that she would want to use for her potential dojo. She decided to talk to one of her recent besties, 18, about becoming a joint master there. She was sort of curious, what kind of fighting would this be? If it's all that stuff our husbands do, then I don't think I'd be the right fit for it. Well, why don't we fuse again? Maybe if we record ourselves training, we could get an understanding of what to base the dojo around? What you might like? 18 did like this idea. She had to admit, like Videl admitted to herself. The fusion between them had been the biggest rush of her life. She had never felt so limitless in power. The way the infinite engine of hers worked with Videl, how it was able to work in the first place was remarkable. Any excuse to fuse again was welcome in both of their books. They would just do it. Over the weeks that followed, that exactly happened. Vizuli would record herself plotting out techniques and taking notes of how to demonstrate these methods. And granted, it'd be pretty surreal to see a metamore infusion mostly sitting down and writing stuff, but this provided a more conducive result instead of just the two of them writing separate notes or trying to bash heads together. It would be a much more constructive manner. It was more effective. Sometimes, the Zuli would rope Krillin and Gohan into sparring with them one at a time, or at least observing them, to which Krillin was mesmerized by this fusion, as well as Videl's improvement, since he first took her under his wing. Well, Gohan, to think her leap in power came from hooking up with you, a Saiyan. If I'd been born a girl, who knows? Maybe Goku and I would be a couple. <laughs> I mean, how weird would that be, Gohan? Gohan looked a little uncomfortable at the thought. Very weird. Krillin laughed. He didn't take exception to this. The last few years have made the two of them very good friends, so the banter was pretty much to be expected. One day, Videl and 18 had just diffused when Shin came into contact with them, visiting the planet. He had been observing their fusion training for some time, and was curious to test out something, as well as get something in return. He hailed the pair as they were cooling down. Hello there. I wish to ask you something. 18 is intrigued as to the direct conversation. You seem to be very adept at this fusion technique. Very skilled, in fact. I wish to learn a thing or two myself, you see. All the stuff that's happened since I discovered the power here on Earth, it's greatly skewed what I thought was possible. It seems that indeed there are beings that are stronger than Frieza. 18 rolled her eyes. Finally, you noticed. So what's your point? Well, I could do with some training. I feel that asking Gohan or Vegeta for such sparring would be a little bit out of my league, so... 18 stood up and walked over to Shin, looking down at him with contempt. Are you saying that we're less of a challenge? Weak, are we? Hmm? Shin was sweating buckets, but Videl calmed 18 down. Listen, 18, that's not what he's getting at. I understand, Shin. Vegeta isn't exactly a good sparring partner, and Gohan is indeed a little bit too much for you. We can help. Right, 18? 18 still looked nettled, but she then spotted Shin's earrings. She remembered something. Say, Pint Size, are those earrings the same ones that the boys used to fuse together? Shin looked at the Patara and nodded. Yes, these are the same. 18 thought and then nodded. Okay, we can train you up a bit. One condition. You teach us how to use those things. Videl looked confused. Why, 18? Metamorphic fusion's good enough. Think about it. It's another means of fusion. One that was apparently stronger. I mean, that's what your hubby said. Videl stopped in her tracks. True, but isn't it permanent? 
Shin wasn't sure if it was or not. He didn't remember the aftermath of the Vegahan Boo battle. He had assumed that Boo's bad air caused the separation. Just fighting around Boo would just make it not work. Well, we could use your Dragon Balls to separate if you don't want to be fused together anymore. 18 Videl thought about it some more, and then ultimately agreed. 18 did like the idea of another means of fusion, especially if it led to an even stronger version. As for Videl, she felt pity towards Shin and thought he deserved some toughening up, to believe in himself more, be the Supreme Kai he's supposed to be. Shin reminded her actually of when the boys were struggling under Piccolo's tutelage. Maybe the right words here would help Shin gain some confidence. I mean, it can't make him any worse. When the training commenced, Videl did most of the training with Shin initially, since she was more keen to toughen him up, whereas 18 was a little more heavy handed as you might understand. Keen to do more of the Patara studying, trying to hurry the whole thing along. And after a couple of weeks, Shin did feel like he was making progress and believed in himself more. That was half the battle. He reckoned his power had been focused enough thanks to the basic training he had received from Videl. He didn't need to be the strongest being in the universe or anything because the dragon team was there, but this would be just enough to break through the mentality of thinking that Frieza's power was the be all and end all, the almighty and insurmountable. It totally wasn't. However, 18's patience had been wearing thin. Okay, this is getting old Shin. We've done our bit, Kai. Now hand over the earrings. Shin, having gotten used to 18's relatively abrasive nature, casually took off his earrings and handed them to them both. Very well. Be sure to put them on opposite ears or else it won't work. When it does, you will know. They did so as instructed, and almost instantly, they were dragged towards one another and slammed into each other's chests. A white light emerges, and out from it appears a different fusion to Vizuli long black hair, a sharp jaw, as well as a long black and white striped shirt and blue cargo pants. The fusion looked at itself and could feel the power. Wow, this feels way better than the other fusion. But what to call ourselves? I want it to be different. Hmm. As the fusion pondered, Shin laughed to himself. <laughs> the first thing is always the name. Cute. In the end, the fusion comes up with the name of Adel, with 18 taking the first syllable this time around. A, 18, Del, Videl. Now we have the combination of unlocked potential and the infinite engine. This power was incredible. Nice. This is just the ticket. Hey Shin, take us back to Earth. I want to take on our hubbies. Shin nodded and was curious to see the results for himself. Thanks to instantaneous movement, they were teleported back to Krillin's house in the city, where he and Gohan were just hanging out casually whilst their wives were away. Hey boys. Check this out. Krillin turned and spat out his coffee all over Gohan's face. Oh, oh, oh. Gohan was curious, then spotting the earrings and being unfazed. Oh, you fused like I did with Vegeta. Cool. Adel looked put out. Way to ruin the surprise, Gohan. Shin explained that this fusion was a reward for their help with Super Buu. But then he's cut off by Adel, who then exclaims that she wants to fight them both at once. Gohan is curious to see the effects of this combination, but Krillin... He's still smitten with Adel's looks. Hey, short stuff, Adel shouted at Krillin. You're ogling Gohan's missus too, you know. There'll be time for that later. Krillin snapped out of it, which made Adel chuckle to herself. However, the main event was about to begin. With Shin transporting them away from the city, Adel versus Gohan and Krillin began. The battle was fascinating for Gohan. They had indeed gotten stronger, and if it hadn't been for Krillin's help, he might have actually been on the back foot in a little bit of trouble. He would have to go all out against this fusion. Adel was feeling pumped. She was giving Gohan problems, a challenge, which meant that this fusion could be counted on for doing some really big good. All they had to do was have some earrings to hand ready in case things went down on Earth. They'd be ready at the front line, stronger than Vegeta maybe. Then when this was done, they could just use the Dragon Balls to defuse again. No problem, be it the Mechian ones or Earth ones, whichever one was to hand. However, this is when the time limit becomes apparent to them. One hour later, despite the infinite engine stamina buff, Adel defused mid-punch, which sent Gohan flying, since there was nothing to punch, into a mountain thanks to the forward momentum. Shin was stunned, whereas 18 was majorly bummed. She took out her anger at Shin. Hey, what gives? I thought this wouldn't defuse on its own. Uh, I, I don't know. I thought so too. I mean, it's only been an hour. I thought it was permanent otherwise as well. Gohan, who had gotten himself out of the rubble, thought about this conundrum. Well, Shin, 
Has Patara ever been used on non-Kai people before? Well, no actually, Gohan. Maybe it isn't permanent after all between mortal beings. Huh. You learn something new every day. But hey, at least we don't need to waste wishes on your Dragon Balls, right? <laughs> he nervously laughed as 18 was stewing. However, Krillin was there to soothe her anger. It's okay, 18. You did great out there. This means you got another way to help us. I knew that Videl and you could do great together. 18 brushed her hair back. I suppose. Come on, Krillin. Let's go home. Once things had mellowed out again, Videl pitched the idea to her father about setting up a new dojo in their name. Hercule liked the idea a lot, as did his agent. This could be the resurrection of the old satin castle. My old dojo could be reborn with this new power of yours and my know-how of fate. This could set us up for life, darling. Videl laughed. Come on, Dad. You can offer your own style, too. It's not all about me. This is for you, too. Hercule was stunned. Oh, my. So modest, too? Well, that Gohan's not so bad after all, I guess. Well, let's do it, sweetie. They fist bump, and the new Satan Castle Dojo is under construction. It's been four years since Majin Buu was quelled, and we now cut to the outer reaches of the universe. A cat has woken up from their four-decade slumber and has been troubled by some very perplexing visions that he saw in his dreams. He consults with his associates, and it is revealed to him that a being known as the Super Saiyan God was the thing that he had been looking for, and that was why he had been awoken. The potential rival was about to rise up from obscurity and would be poised to challenge him. Beerus hadn't felt this stoked in centuries. At last! Something interesting to focus on in this dull universe. I hope he knows some good food places as well. His attendant rolls his eyes, despite there being a perfectly good platter of food right here on this table. Oh, that Beerus. He does get passionate every few millennia, doesn't he? Now this is where things get interesting. The being that Beerus had predicted to see was, of course, Goku. But things have changed since he first saw his predictions 39 years previously. As you know in this story, Goku had been granted the power of unlocked potential, and as far as he was concerned, this was a bad thing. He thought that he'd stagnated. Despite Gohan and Videl proving that you could improve whilst using this power in some way, Goku's mind wasn't really working the same way. Thanks to his full Saiyan instincts, they'd been neutered as far as he was concerned. That lust for battle and to improve oneself had been clipped, and it was a major blow to his psyche. In some ways, it meant that he had to focus on other things, on his home more. And as a result, he actually ended up getting more satisfaction with his place, with Chi Chi, as well as training up Goten, rather than just getting gains for himself. He was much more selfless. So when the purple cat rocked up, not at King Kai's place, but at Mount Palzu this time, Goku was taken aback. He had no idea who this person was. Hastily, King Kai barked into his ear. Goku, do not say anything yet. That person you're talking to is Lord Beerus. Beerus, huh? Why is he here for me? I don't know. But please, Goku, don't do anything stupid. He's a being who could wipe out your planet in a second if you displease him. Before the Kai could provide more intel, Beerus chooses to speak up. Saiyan. You are a Saiyan, right? Goku looked curious, but stayed silent. Beerus cocked his eye. Silent type, are we? You dare stoke the ire of your god? More silence. King Kai realized that Goku was being too literal. Okay, 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 okay. Say your name at least. Yeah, my name's Goku. What are you doing here? King Kai loudly groaned in terror. Whis then spoke up to explain. Apologies for the standoff, Saiyan. My name is Whis. This here is my master, the god of destruction, Lord Beerus. He is here to ask you something. Beerus then waved Whis aside and walked up to Goku, sizing him up. Meanwhile, Goten had hidden behind a nearby tractor, unsure what to make of this creature. Was he a friend or foe? If you are a Saiyan, then you might be the thing that I have been looking for. I wish to fight you. Goku looked puzzled. Now, if this were normal Super Goku, oh, he'd be game in this for an instant. But this Goku was pretty disinclined to do so. I'm not interested, Lord Beerus. I no longer wish to fight people. I'm happy where I am. Beerus was very surprised by this response. Goodness! A Saiyan who doesn't want to fight. 
You misunderstand my wording, though. You don't have a say in this matter. You are going to fight me. Goku got in its stance. The answer is still no. Now get out of here. Beerus looked very nettled. Whis very interested, though, in this level of resistance. Now that he had had a closer look at Goku's aura, Whis could sense that he had his potential unlocked by the Elder Kai. The fight began and Goku was immediately on the back foot, but not by too much. He was able to prevent Beerus from bodying him into the dust in a second, but neither was he really amounting to anything that would pique the cat's interest or intrigue, thinking that Goku was the Super Saiyan God. It wasn't very convincing. Whis, now adjusting to his new supposition, was nodding. Just as I thought, his desire for battle has been tempered. The fight continues for a little bit longer, but Beerus is getting frustrated that this Saiyan isn't really showing any passion or will to go all out like any other Saiyan would do. The angel could sense the cat getting very annoyed, thinking he might blow up the planet here and now before getting any closer to the Super Saiyan God. So he chose to intervene with words. Lord Beerus, might I interject? I'm afraid that your prediction might have been a little off. This Saiyan, Son Goku, I believe, has received training from the Elder Kai. The Elder Kai? Didn't I lock him in a sword or something? You did, but it seems that he has since been released. Given the power that Goku wields... What's your point, Whis? My point is, is that Goku cannot give you the fight that you are looking for. He is not the Super Saiyan God. Super Saiyan God? Goku rolls around his tongue. Beerus curses, walking up to Goku, eyeing him up again. What a joke! A Saiyan who doesn't want to fight! You're of no sport at all! He flicks Goku away, sending him careening into a nearby hill. The kitty turns to the angel, as if nothing had happened, as Goten frantically flies over to tend to his father. Please tell me that there are other Saiyans here, Whis. The flight over here was just unbearable. Fear not, Lord Beerus. There are indeed more examples here. Good! Maybe one of them will actually give me something interesting. A proper challenge. With that, they casually fly away off to Bulma's birthday party. Like in the original, Bulma was angry that nobody from the Son family other than Gohan had shown up. Since Goku had retired, even Chi Chi had been quite distant, very keen to make the most of this change of mood in her husband. It might not last forever. It meant that they barely heard anything from the family other than Goten sometimes coming over to play with Trunks, but this was getting rarer and rarer by the month. Of course, yeah, Gohan would drop in after his job at the local library, and after his first conferences. Videl was also saddened to have seen less of Goku lately. They had visited there, sure, but in the last year or so, Goku had become even more reclusive. Was this something to do perhaps with the Elder Kai thing? Was it affecting him, making him feel worse? She wasn't sure, but it was something that she and Gohan had noticed at the very least. Meanwhile, Vegeta got a nasty reminder of his past, when Beerus and Whis had arrived on the cruise ship to which they had been having his wife's party. The interactions between them play out like in the original. In fact, a lot of stuff on the ship happens exactly the same, except for the omission of Gotenks, Trunks cursing that Goten wasn't here. If only he were here, we could kick this cat's ass! Trunks, the language! Sorry, Mom, but still, why didn't Goten come here? Is he acting like Goku now as well? Bulma was very concerned that all this disruption hadn't roused Goku into action at all. This wasn't the Goku she remembered. Well, of course it wasn't. That Goku had gone. We also have the revelation of God Key being explained by Dende to Piccolo and Tapion. Remember, Tapion is here from the last part as Dende's bodyguard. Your Grace, shall I interject with this interloper? Dende frantically shook his head. N no, Tapion! You cannot fight him! He... He's a god of destruction. The god of destruction. He would tear you apart. Tapion then mulled over this fact and then remembered his studies with his master a couple of years back. He recalled the tales of Beerus and now that tale was a reality right in front of him. This is very bad, Tapion says, with Piccolo looking at him. Usually that would be his line. He's right at home, clearly. We also have the My Bulma moment with Vegeta, with the prince definitely giving Beerus a challenge of some kind, but only for a few seconds. Now, you might be wondering why Gohan and Videl haven't really been doing anything. Well, they got told, by many others as well, that King Kai, via telepathy, 
they should be extremely careful around Beerus, which they took seriously, of course. They actually complied with the rules. Also, they were very surprised to see Vegeta acting scared of this thing. This was bad indeed. When it becomes clear that he wasn't going to get the challenge that he wanted, the cat and angel take their leave, only to prepare to blow up the planet, despite the good food. What a waste. If only these creatures were just that little bit stronger. I might have overlooked the lack of Super Saiyan God. Their food was good though. Just then, Goku instant transmits to the scene after getting a barrage of angry voicemail messages from King Kai, with Goten by his side. You! Are you actually going to try this time? I sense something in you, but your coward has got in the way. I'm not here to fight you. There has to be another way to settle this. For you to find your Super Saiyan God. Well, of course there is. Shenron is summoned after Beerus is told about the Dragon Balls, and the dragon informs the group about the ritual in question. And sure enough, this does calm Beerus down for the moment, as he is very curious about the situation. Well, I mean, he is a cat after all. However, as one strong being settles, the other nettles. Vegeta, having seen Goku shrug off this major threat, is getting angrier and angrier. What is Kakarot doing? Shirking his Saiyan pride is bad enough, but to willingly be so brash with Earth's survival? I don't even recognize him anymore. This causes Vegeta to step up. If there is a god you're looking for, then you're looking at them. He does his signature thumb pose. <laughs> you? Vegeta? Oh, that is funny. But at least you're showing some kind of pluck unlike this one over here. Can you give me what I came here for? Vegeta smiles. Oh, yes. The ritual takes place, but then they of course realize that they're one Saiyan down, which is when Videl's pregnancy is revealed, and Gohan is understandably overjoyed, as is a little Marin, who is very excited to see Videl having a baby. They bring Videl to the circle and assume that she might be good enough because there's technically some Saiyan DNA in there. However, this is where we're going to be adding some lore to the matter. You see, given how Videl has her potential unlocked and her strength is far greater than in the original, these are untested waters. You see, the people who came up with this ritual in the first place, the original Saiyans, had never considered how Blutz waves worked when non-Saiyans were a factor, and how they would react to said waves, because there weren't any non-Saiyans around there. Yes, this does mean that this yellow-haired Videl thing is being expanded upon. This was clearly an untapped story thread, much like with the overly dragged out frame of green-haired Vegeta from the Broly movie, which led to Divine Mind Vegeta from one of our other discussions. During this ritual, Videl feels very strange. She could feel her stomach getting warm, her hair fizzing with a strange energy, and her body on the whole feeling very weird. Little did she know that with being connected to five other Saiyan beings, as well as having one cooking inside of her, she was being exposed to S-cells, the lure that Toriyama added recently. This didn't feel bad or anything, it was just very unusual. However, the main event played out and Vegeta this time became the Super Saiyan God instead of Goku. There you go folks, I'm not Vegeta bashing this time, as many of you think I do. While Vegeta was going all out against Beerus, much more so than Goku in the original, Whis was more intrigued with Videl. Saiyan hybrids, eh? Hmm. Also, the way her body reacted to the ritual was very interesting. He should tell Beerus about that later. He introduces himself to Gohan and Videl, and they would talk richly about stuff as the prince and cat were duking it out. Vegeta, being more passionate to fight this cat, given what he had done to Bulma, is giving the destroyer a real challenge. Beerus was getting very excited by this battle. This seemed to be very special. He had personal history with the prince, and seeing him grow from just that sniveling child cowering in the corner into becoming the Super Saiyan God was rather poetic. I have to hand it to you, Vegeta. Your progression is leaving me most pleased. It's like a good book. A nice little fairy tale. Vegeta smirks. It goes to show you, Lord Beerus. You should never underestimate us Saiyans. You will rue the day when you do. And today is said day. He lunges forward and catches Beerus on the jaw. But this doesn't upset the cat. It makes him laugh. But sure enough, Vegeta does fall out of the power. The prince does lose the overall encounter, but the cat is now no longer wanting to blow up the planet for many reasons. When they descend to the ground, Beerus informs everyone that he will not be blowing up Earth today. As he is eating some takoyaki to regain his energy, he converses with Whis, who had informed him about the Dell's condition. 
In this story, Beerus has now even more reason to not blow up Earth and he's tied more to it and its people. He had seen Gohan and Videl, strong fighters supposedly, about to have a child with Saiyan DNA in it and it having an effect seemingly on the female host. This then led Vegeta to being almost an equal to him. There was a connection here. These people are worth keeping around, he thought. Maybe the real Super Saiyan God is yet to come. Perhaps that unborn child might have something to do with it. That might be the real deal with Vegeta. Oh, oh Vegeta. He was just the beginning of the exponential curve of power that would be yet to come. And it would then become Pan, the legendary Super Saiyan. You two, he points to the couple. I'll be keeping a close eye on you. This will not be the last you see of us. Whis, be ready to leave. I could do with a nap. Before they left though, Gohan asked Whis about what happened to Videl. Would it have any serious side effects? Hmm, Whis smiles over the question. Perhaps some Saiyan traits might now live on in both the baby and the host. D does that mean that Videl's a Saiyan now? No, but I can't be certain as to what degree of influence the Saiyan DNA has had on her, but I'm sure you'll find out soon enough. Ta-ta! Whis and Beerus departed, leaving Videl and Gohan confused. A few weeks later, they were actually doing some light sparring whilst mulling over what we said. Videl could see her stomach filling out more by the day, realizing that she probably should be going easy on the training for a little bit, but she was keen not to fall too far behind. Gohan? Yes, honey? Whatever you gain in the future, be sure to share with me. You're not allowed to get too far ahead of me, you got that? She stuck her tongue out to assure him that this wasn't a serious threat or anything. It was just more of like a pinky promise to which Gohan nodded. Of course. I'm just glad that we're going to be finally starting a family. They kiss and deep within Videl's body, it's getting very frenetic in the genetics. We resume the story with Videl being quite perplexed as to what she was being subject to. She was in a very unusual place, a palace on the top of a backwards pyramid with a cat eyeing up her swollen stomach, making very weird grunts and mutterings to himself. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Beerus? When you said you wanted to keep a close eye on me, I didn't think you meant literally. Beerus averted his attention up to the bump's host and explained, My dear, you and your unborn child are probably the most interesting things to have happened to me, come my way even, in millennia. Vegito, you see, he was the opening act in my book. You two, though. Fascinating. Videl felt very awkward, like she was seen as some kind of freak show to this deity. Whis, though, thankfully, interjected at that moment. Apologies, Videl. Lord Beerus does sometimes display a woeful lack of subtlety. I should have you know, Whis, that I am extremely subtle when I wish to be. Really? Blowing up planets for having the wrong delicacies on offer isn't what I would describe as being subtle. What does food have to do with this? He motions to Videl, making her feel more like an object than ever. Permit me to explain. Lord Beerus believes that the ritual to give rise to the Super Saiyan God might have left some kind of imprint within your DNA. Videl blinked. Does that mean that I'm part Saiyan? Hard to say, but you have been directly exposed to their genetic makeup, and not just with the gestation of your child. It'll be most intriguing to see what happens, if anything. In any case, Lord Beerus likes to have a project on the go. Videl then pondered another point. Wait, why did you wish me to watch this training again, Lord Beerus? I can't exactly take part right now, you know? Beerus glared at her. Why should it concern you? I requested your presence here. That is enough justification. Just be sure to pay close attention. Beerus walked off to the nearby buffet cart and picked some rather fancy earth delicacies that the dragon team members had presented to him as some sort of favour for all of the training. Videl then held her head in her hands and simply watched her husband, Vegeta and Goku training with one another, taking on board the information that Whis had provided just now, and especially before the angel stepped in again to continue the training. She paid close attention to how God Key worked. This became the pattern for many months. As Videl grew bigger, as did the Saiyan's powers. In fact, Vegeta seemed to have managed to progress the most. He actually made the most obvious gains. He had perfected the Super Saiyan God technique and then started to, with the help from Goku's experience, to have concocted some kind of hybrid of Super Saiyan with the Super Saiyan God power. It resulted in some kind of blue-haired form. 
I don't know how red and yellow make blue, but it left the prince stronger and in fact, on par with Gohan's ultimate form. As for Gohan and Goku, who both had their potential unlocked and couldn't obviously overtly go Super Saiyan, it didn't follow the same train of power gain. Both Gohan and Goku, much more so the former, treated this exposure to God Ki as like some kind of power boost. Gohan had naturally increased his potential, thinking that this would rub off well on Goku, making him think that he can regain his vigor from before the ritual with the Elder Kai, that there is hope for him yet, and it actually sort of worked. Training with his son and former rival did make Goku feel quite peppy. He seemed to be smiling his old smile more often. Ah, oh, this takes me back. I've missed this feeling of training. I thought this was all lost, but I guess this god key has opened it all up again. This was then confirmed by the Elder Kai and Shin, who dropped in to see them train, the Elder Kai being very wary of Beerus, given their understandable history. Goku asked whether God Ki could supersede potential being unlocked. Of course it would, shouted the Elder Kai, like this was the most obvious question in existence. It's a whole other branch of power that we Kais don't possess. God Ki will certainly enhance your energy. It's something quite different to traditional Ki. Goku nodded and felt quite energized, hopeful. But his mind was still settled. He didn't feel the need to drop everything like he used to. He liked what he had established over the last few years. He was happy with that lot. But at least now his potential had been extended just that little bit more. He felt less empty. And that was nice. One day, back on Earth, the moment came. Videl gave birth to Pan, and the entire dragon team were there to greet the young babe. With Beerus and Whis then making a surprise visit not long after the arrival. Apologies for the lateness, uttered Whis. We had to stop for a snack break halfway through the Andromeda Galaxy. Beerus was picking his teeth after a particularly nice morsel. So where is it then? Where is this child? Beerus said without a modicum of tact. He barged his way through and soon set his eyes on the young Pan. His face eased and he smiled warmly. Excellent. She is perfect. He reached out his finger and Pan grabbed it, letting out a little giggle. Beerus blushed profusely, hoping nobody would notice. They did but they chose not to say anything. Whis then looked at Pan. Lovely. Now Videl, I must ask, how do you feel? Videl thought about this for a second, her brain still quite muddled after the whole ordeal. It hadn't been the smoothest of experiences actually. In fact, there was one point where it looked like she was gravely ill at death's door. But now though, she felt absolutely peachy. I feel great actually. Hard to think that just a few hours ago I felt like I was about to kill over and die. Chi Chi nodded. That would be the Saiyan influence there, honey. Honestly, birthing my boys was quite the experience, I can tell you. We smiled. <laughs> As we thought, Lord Beerus and I's suppositions were correct. Videl, you were gravely unwell recently, but now you feel better than ever. Does that trait ring a bell with you, Vegeta? <laughs> Somehow, Gohan's woman has acquired... The ancient Saiyan power. That Zenkai, by the way. The prince looked very irked that a human would somehow have gained this trait without being of Saiyan heritage. The room shook, though. Only to have the situation punctured by Pan gurgling jovially. Gohan was astonished. I knew it! That was the thing you said, Whis! Whis nodded. Correct, Gohan. I believe you have a theory cooking. I can tell when you're fired up. Do proceed. He gives Gohan the floor. We have been talking to me about Saiyan DNA in our downtime training. I found it all rather enthralling, as I hadn't really thought about it up until now. The ritual was a very compelling paradigm to explore. Vegeta coughed. In English, bookworm! Right, right. Well, the ritual to give you the power of the Super Saiyan God, Vegeta, it left its mark on Videl. Somehow, Saiyan cells have been suffused with her human cells. She's not a Saiyan hybrid like I am, per se, or like Pan here. But she's sort of like a... human plus? This permeated the room and this led Hercule to panic. Does that mean my baby girl is some kind of mutant? What did you all do to my daughter and now granddaughter? Relax, Hercule, said Whis calmly. Fidel is perfectly healthy. In fact, her body has rejuvenated from the rigors of childbirth rather quickly. In normal circumstances, I would have offered to birth the child myself, without the need of surgical primitive intervention. But... Given Lord Beerus' theory and wishes, I decided to let nature take its course. Videl looked angry, almost throttling Weiss. What? 
You mean to tell me you could have spared me all that pain at any moment? Oh, do think of the bigger picture, my dear. You'll thank me later. Simply by being there watching the others train, you and your daughter shall reap many rewards, especially the youngling. But all in good time, though. For the months that followed that cryptic thing from Beerus, the situation eased. Pan took to her new home fabulously, and Gohan and Videl were overjoyed to have her. Thanks to her father's riches and the now open new Satan Castle School being chaired currently by Android 18 until Videl was ready to come back full time, their financial situation was quite secure, meaning that Gohan's job wasn't as pivotal to their lives. Less conferences, so they could spar again. Videl was pleased to be able to do so, and now with this Saiyan power apparently in her arsenal, she could keep up with everyone and maybe outshine Piccolo. The Namekian not too happy to hear this, despite getting to look after Baby Pan like in the original. Uncle Piccolo does show up. This was all disrupted when Frieza decided to leave his mark. His revival is basically the same as the original outing, only this time, the group of Dragon Team members who are there to greet him is slightly altered. This time out, Goku joins the party alongside the rest, with now also a fighting fit Videl, and of course, the rest of the group. Frieza was very pleased to see Goku present. Well, well, it's very nice for you to have arrived on time for my arrival. I appreciate this gesture so much that I will let you warm up with my troops. Soldiers, get ready to teach this monkey a lesson. The soldiers, though, were very wary of this. They're going in to fight Goku, the guy who previously defeated their master. Was their emperor's brain still discombobulated from the regeneration? One soldier decided to question this, but was met by a finger blast from Freezer. So I guess this is now the 999 soldier battle instead. With that, the soldiers launch towards the group, and this is where Goku and Gohan turn up their ultimate powers to full wick. A bit unnecessarily, but this is enough to perk Vegeta's attention all the way at Beerus's palace. Lord Beerus! shouts Vegeta. Looks like we've got trouble on Earth. I can feel Kakarot and Gohan's power flaring up. Whis checks his staff, and sure enough, things do look pretty hairy on Earth. You're right, Vegeta. It seems Freezer is paying your friends a visit. F Freezer? We need to get back now! This is my chance to get revenge. Whis nodded and prepared to leave. Beerus, currently having a nap after their training session. I must say, Prince, your connection with those two has gotten rather stronger since we started training. Vegeta scoffed. What do you expect when you train with them non-stop? You can sense everything they do. It's like they're part of your psyche. Now enough babbling, let's get moving. The battle was going as you would expect. With the addition of Goku at full power and Gohan in his ultimate form, the soldiers were being picked off left, right, and center. Even Videl was getting many takedowns, choosing to knock out her opponents instead of outright blasting them away. However, this would come to a head when the likes of Tagoma stepped in, or should I say, Ginyu Tagoma. With Gohan busy with Shisami, Videl stepped up and fought Tagoma. As for Goku, he decided to sit this out, seeing that his son and daughter-in-law had this under control. This got under Freezer's skin. What? You're choosing to kick back and let the others do your job for you? Goku looked up and smiled. I've changed a lot since we last fought, Freezer. I no longer desire to fight the way I used to. Besides, Gohan and Videl have got this. I say, let them have it. This was not what Frieza wanted to hear. You filthy monkey! You wish to toy with me! Just like back then. This caused Frieza to fester in his own fury. Meanwhile, Gohan was easily getting rid of Shisami, and Videl was utterly dominating Tagama given her new Saiyan power, which had led to some quite impressive gains. With Pan in the care of her father, she didn't have to worry about collateral damage or all that, or her baby getting in the crossfire. She could go all out. This felt like the good old days with Boo, and this was fun. Tagama was getting more and more desperate though, and he chose to take his anger out on Gohan, who had his guard down after his battle with Shisami had come to its conclusion. With his aura lowered slightly, Gohan got blasted in the back, which hurt like Hiffle, and caused him to fall to the ground in pain. You! How dare you hurt Gohan! You asked for it! She rushed Tagama and beat him up senseless, ending it with a full power Masenko, which utterly vaporized the minion. This was her first kill, but this didn't process until afterwards, when Gohan rose up next to her, thanks to a sensu beam from Krillin. Gohan, you're okay! Yeah? Krillin brought some sensu beans, luckily. 
Where's the other minion, Videl? I... I... I killed him. I've never done that before. My god. Videl was shaken by this, but Gohan was there to comfort her. Videl, it's okay. You did it defending us. You did it to protect me. Thank you. I love you, Videl. I love you too, Gohan. They kiss and high five. <laughs> Quite the touching scene. The two look to Frieza. Since the reason for me coming here is choosing to be no fun, I will instead take my ire out on you two. That being said, I am intrigued to see you have progressed, young Gohan. I remember you being quite the pest on Nemec. Let's see how you square up against my newfound power. Your final form, Frieza? Gohan said. That's nothing compared to us anymore. I could squish you in one punch just like that. <laughs> That's where you're wrong. Permit me to demonstrate. Frieza lets out his anger at being snubbed by Goku and charges up to his golden Frieza form. Omitting all that preamble in his final form from the original, that wasn't needed. That was pure fluff in my opinion. Frieza set his sights on Videl and Gohan, with Goku looking up from below, with a smile on his face. Hm. Fool. He's rushing into this battle like before. The rest of the group are confused at what he means by this, but it's going to become clear later. This means we get Golden Frieza going up against a couple of Gohan and Videl. And this battle is pretty exciting to watch. Videl isn't the main hitter, but she is certainly giving Frieza some trouble, where Gohan is there to provide the big strikes. The reason I chose to do this was to expand upon the history and weird relationship that Frieza has towards Gohan. Bizarre respect in a way. It was touched upon during the Tournament of Power, and here it can be manifested in a different and more compelling way, which can provide a more interesting and different outcome. With both Gohan and Videl at full charge and with their training at maximum, Frieza is being slowly whittled down by the pair. Stamina, Namek, that same thing. And in the end, it looks like Gohan is about to land the final blow. But then of course he's distracted again and is shot through the heart and Sorbet's to blame. Videl is horrified again at seeing her beloved hurt. She forgets about Frieza rushing over to Gohan and Frieza laughs and still in his golden form. <laughs> Love does make creatures do crazy things. You've left yourself wide open. Goodbye, Son Gohan. He's about to blast the pair away, but is then slammed in the jaw by a rushing prince. Vegeta has made it in time. Frieza skids to a stop to see the prince spoiling for a fight, his face contorting into a sinister smile. <laughs> Vegeta. Videl, turn to your man. Frieza, let me show you my real power. My ultimate power! Vegeta powers up to reveal Super Saiyan Blue. But Frieza doesn't realize its capabilities. Thinking this was just another game or not as powerful as the power he had witnessed with Gohan. However, Vegeta is in no mood for beating about the bush. Unlike the original, he's going to be just doing a more refined version of mine, 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 In one blast, he launches a supercharged godly Big Bang attack. Frieza doesn't try to evade or block, thinking this was nothing, but... That changed until it was too late. With a howl of shock, Frieza is vaporized in an instant. And when the dust is cleared, there is not a trace of Frieza left. No chunks, nothing. Vegeta lowers his arm and smiles. Finally, it's over. He powers down and walks over to Gohan and Videl. You two, well done. You softened him up for me. Now we are truly rid of that pest. He walks over to Goku and thanks him for the tip off. Goku giving him the thumbs up. I knew you wouldn't want to miss out on this one, Vegeta. I didn't have to go all out back then, but I had a feeling you wouldn't get the message if Gohan and I didn't give you some kind of hint. Vegeta smiles and sits down to relax for a bit. Now everything was done. We like to address the Universe 6 tournament. We will not be covering it this time out. You see, the lineup doesn't really change except that Gohan replaces Goku. And if you're thinking Videl's going to be part of it, remember, you know, she's just had a baby. The only other thing that really changes is that Hit respects Gohan this time out instead of his father. The outcome with Zeno is identical, so we will not retread old ground. But now we resume the story not long after the battle with Frieza. Gohan had taken stock with what had happened during the 999 soldier battle. He had seen his father take part in the fight, and Gohan was happy to see his father rekindle his love for battling strong foes. But there was also a feeling of seriousness weighing down upon him. It had become clear 
that Goku was not going to be returning to his former status as the number one defender of Earth. Nor did he want to, and nor did he want his father to be dragged back into said role. So he decided to make a call and visit his parents at Mount Paozu. As Pan, Chi Chi and Goten were playing, Gohan and his father sat down to have a chat. Dad, it was really good to see you fighting alongside us. I haven't seen you that fired up in ages. It was good to feel that spark. I thought I'd never feel it again after what happened, but it still doesn't change the fact that I'm happy with what I've got. Of course, that's why I came to ask you something. Seeing as it looks like that it's up to Vegeta and I to defend Earth, could you... Gohan shuffled. Could you teach me instant transmission? Haven't I taught you guys that before? Gohan shook his head. No, I've been meaning to ask you this for years, but it does seem like a very useful technique. Goku laughed. <laughs> yep, it's gotten us out of many tight jams over the years. Could have sworn that I planned to share it with you guys, but <laughs> I guess I forgot. Okay, Gohan, I could do that no problem. At least I could do. Gohan smiled. Awesome. Thank you, Dad. They hug it out, and then Goku set about teaching Gohan the ins and outs of this technique, passing the torch. Months later, Gohan has started to get to the grips of the likes of instant transmission. Thanks to Goku's skills in explaining the technique, as well as Gohan's academic brain, he was able to use it to a moderate degree of effect. Goku, in fact, was so impressed that he even took Gohan to the Yard Rat to visit Pibara, his former master. The Elder was very impressed with the teachings that Goku had been able to practice before coming to him. Whenever you wish to perfect this technique, young one, and perhaps explore others, you are more than welcome to visit again. When they got back, they had been summoned to Capsule Corp after somebody from the future had made a shocking return to their past. They, in fact, had never expected to see him again, but here he was. Trunks had arrived. Bulma was happy to see Goku and Gohan arrive. Guys, he's pretty bad. Look at him, he's so beat up, poor thing. Trunks, shouted Gohan, trying to shake him out of his delirium. G gohan Yes, Trunks, it's me. It's all right, you're safe. Trunks smiled. I made it. Good. He then fainted. When the time traveler awoke, the group were around his bed, and when he did clap eyes on everybody, and then Vegeta, he averted his gaze looking very forlorn. What's the matter, boy? Why can't you look at me? It's... It's hard to explain, father. Goku and Gohan blink, confused as to why father and son couldn't look at each other. They had departed on such good terms too, before back in the day. What had happened? When Trunks does calm down further, he starts to explain why he had come back into the past. In his future, a menace called Black had begun his reign of terror upon Earth, undoing everything he and his family had done to rebuild it. And this being, somehow, resembled his father. I don't know why, but that monster is not like you, father. I know that. But it's still hard to look at you. You two look frighteningly alike. Vegeta blinked. What about your mother? Is she safe? No, she's gone. Black killed her. Vegeta's fist clenched. The news that his wife and the future had been slain so heinously was very hard to stomach, despite his present wife being right there in the same room. That scum! Trunks! Whatever it is you need, I will assist you. Nobody gets away with harming my family! Goku and Gohan were stunned to hear this coming out of the prince's mouth. Even Bulma blushed a little. Wow, Vegeta. That's like... The nicest thing you said to me. Vegeta blushed too, and Trunks nodded. Thank you. I need all the help that I can get. The next day, Videl had come over to visit Trunks. Gohan felt it would be good for her to get to know one of the people who had helped him destroy Cell back in the day. Trunks was also pleased to meet her, happy to have heard that Gohan had married and even had a family. Another guest had made his arrival at Capsule Corp. Tapion. Tapion had been alerted to Trunks' sudden landing on Earth and was ready to stop him, but then Dende stopped him, explaining that his aura was a friendly one. He remembered future Trunks from back in the day when he was just a kid, and had only recently been placed as the Guardian of Earth. When Tapion reassessed the aura, he too felt that it resembled that of the young son of Bulma. Curious by this anomaly, he decided to check it out anyway and was blown away with what he saw. How... how is this possible? Time travel, my friend, Trunks explained. Time travel? My word. I never thought I'd live to see the day. Why did you come here? I came to seek help from my friends. 
I was here to offer my help a while back. My future, though, has been destroyed. An evil force has wreaked havoc upon it, and there is no one left to truly take it down or help me. That's why I'm here. Tapion's face eased and he nodded. I understand. Something similar happened to my home. He kneels with his sword, standing tall. I wish to aid you also in your efforts. Perhaps we can still save your future. Tapion then notices the sword by Trunks' bed. I see that you also carry a sword. Trunks then spotted the Templar's weapon and saw that it bizarrely looked like his old one. But before they can actually explain it further, right at that moment, Vegeta Black made his arrival and challenges the present Vegeta to a battle. Arjeet's though, unlike Goku, was absolutely furious. You fool! You walk right into my path after what you did in the future. I will see to it that you die right here and right now. He powers up to Blue immediately, expecting this imposter to do the same. He doesn't. Black is stunned to see this power. Before he could think more though, he got a massive punch to the face and is sent careening into the ground below. Trunks is stunned. He'd never seen the Super Saiyan Blue power before. What had they done since he last was here? Black had no answer to this and was beaten to within an inch of his life. And if it hadn't been for the temporal fabric pinging him back into the future, he actually might have died right there, in the past. Oops. Vegeta let out a furious roar of frustration and vowed to finish the job in the future. Boy, when will your time machine be ready? I want to finish that wretch off. How dare he use my face for his foul plans? With that, Bulma set about preparing the fuel required to get back to the future. In that time, Vegeta, Beerus and Whis also conduct their own investigations with the prince, meeting Zamasu and proving to be quite the powerhouse. Then, after that was done, Vegeta, Gohan and Tapion joined Trunks for the first trip back. Why Tapion? Well, he was very determined to see what this future was like and to help said lands, since he couldn't do the same with his own. Or at least, he thought he couldn't. Goku relinquished his seat and said that he will stay here in the past and be ready in case Black decided to reappear again. When they get there, all three visitors were horrified at the sight before them, and when they met the Resistance, they were very impressed with their efforts despite their woeful power gap to Black. Mai was also present and introduced herself to the group. Tapion was very enthused with helping the Resistance and asked how they were able to survive so long. He respected this ragtag group and said he would do his best to aid their efforts as well. However, when Black did get wind of their arrival, his power now was pretty fierce. That extra beatdown had supercharged his power and we then see Vegeta Black Rosé with British accent. I must thank you, Vegeta. Not only have you given me a fabulous body to work with, but your vigorous showing earlier was enough to spark a hidden power I never thought possible. Now you witness this magnificent and wondrous display of strength, right before I use it to eviscerate your mortal hides. Things were going south quickly, and Tapion did his best to aid the resistance to safety, and with his aid, fewer casualties were had as the Saiyans aided Trunks despite Zamasu making his debut and causing mischief with Gohan and Trunks as well. But it was clear, they had no answer right now. They had to go back and regroup. And Tapion then found an injured Mai. Black had got her, but she was just about alive. Trunks, you need to get her to safety. I will stay here and help the others. But Tapion, you'll be stuck in the future. Never mind that. I can't leave these people vulnerable. Now go! Admiring Tapion's resilience, the group do indeed go back, this time with Mai. When they arrive, all four of the occupants fall out of the cockpit. They all need medical attention. Videl taking an injured Gohan into her arms. What happened, Gohan? The, the future. The future we tried to save. It's horrible. As the gang heal up, Mai and Videl get to know each other and provide some scope for the former. She knew that she couldn't directly help out in the future even if she were to fuse alongside 18. I mean, Adele could only do so much, but what she and her bestie could do right now is to ease Mai's pain, give her a distraction. The three do indeed spend time together to provide her some comfort and even some light entertainment and relief, something she hadn't actually felt in years. Mai appreciated this a lot and was happy to have made some friends in the past. Trunks too was satisfied to see Mai welcomed so warmly. She's been through a lot, I can tell you. He could even get over the whole 18 being here thing. Seeing her acting so warmly with his friend was a clear sign that this Android 18 was nothing like the Android 18 he killed in the future. That's one less worry. With Videl's help also, both Trunks spent more time together than the original. It's to further enhance what the show covered. 
but present Trunks to gain perspective also, how his future self had a rough time and to be grateful for what he'd gotten. We also have Gohan chatting with Trunks, this time without the ice cream. But like the original, future Trunks could definitely tell that this Gohan, despite being just as impressively strong as the future version, was softer than his master. He had a more calm disposition and was more sensitive. But when the chips were down, he could step up just as well as future Gohan could, without question. Trunks seeked his guidance and Gohan was more than happy to explain why he was like this. Trunks, you don't have to be constantly fighting. You don't have to make your life's mission be making up for mistakes of the past. You can put down the sword for a bit and consider finding some happiness for yourself. You've done enough for the future. There's only so much one person can do. Trunks was floored. I've not had the chance to think about myself since Black showed up. I wish I could, but it's just so hard, Gohan. We're here for you. You've got a home here where you're loved, where you're safe. We will do whatever we can to help you, Trunks. Meanwhile, Vegeta was busy training in the room of spirit and time, like the original, only this time more fired up than ever. He vowed to get stronger than his evil self. There could be only one, and he would see to it that this interloper would rue the day he decided to imitate him. Back on Earth, the gang were planning what to do. Clearly, a direct attack wouldn't work, so they had to be creative. Goku then thought casually, maybe they could try and do what they tried to do with King Piccolo. We could use the Marvel Bar. But Dad, we can't bring Master Roshi to the future. He wouldn't last a second in front of Black. No, 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 no. I mean, we could learn it. You could learn it, Gohan. I... I could? But... Do we have time, Father? Gohan, you're the smartest guy I know. If anyone can learn something in the blink of an eye, it's you. You got this. This is like one of your textbooks or something. Yeah, Gohan. You told me that you would help my situation. I wish to help yours. Let's both learn it, Gohan. Together. Two days later, both Gohan and Trunks had just about got the hang of Mafuba. Roshi very impressed with Gohan's smarts. Now with a plan B, Vegeta, Gohan and Mai join Trunks for their second and hopefully final attempt to save the future. When they get there, Zamasu and Black were there to greet them. I must thank you, Vegeta, shouted Zamasu. Without your help, my friend here would have never discovered this higher level of power. It's incredible. Soon, our plan will be fulfilled, and it's all down to you, Vegeta cursed. We'll see about that, he rushed Vegeta Black, the being thinking that this Vegeta hadn't gotten stronger. Big mistake. This time out, the power was dominant, as was the spirit. Black had no answer, even with a sigh. You! Say my wife's name! Oh? What was your wife's name? Her name was Bulma! Before Gohan could get the jar and seal both of them away, Fused Zamasu arrived and proved to be quite the handful for all of them. The idea of fusion though does come up, and with now Shin and Goasu here to help, the Patara are used to bring Vegahan forth. For a while, Vegahan Blue was able to give Fuse Zamasu a lot of trouble and bring forth his corrupt form. Sensing that this was the right time to do the deed their side, Trunks was able to do what Gohan couldn't. Trunks shouted out the Mafuba. This was enough to suck Fuse Zamasu into the jar and seal him away. The fusion screaming out that his plan would be undone and that this wasn't justice. When the dust settled, it was clear that the future had been saved. And when Vegahan diffused from the rigors of the blue power, both Vegeta and Gohan were happy to see that Vegeta Black was no more. But when the time came to go back and return Gohan and Vegeta to the past, Tapion requested to stay behind for good. I can do something in this timeline. Forgive me, Gohan. Life with Dende is alright and all, but it's not exactly active. Here I feel like I can make a difference, instead of sitting around and waiting for something to happen. Gohan nodded. I understand, my friend. I'll be sure to let Dende know. I'm sure he too will understand. Thank you, Gohan. It's been an honor to have fought alongside you all. I will rebuild the future here, and maybe conduct a mission to search for new Namek one day. Hopefully it's still around, after what my master told me. With Tapion sticking around with the resistance, the others head back for the past. Now this is where things change. When everyone had celebrated and the time had come for Trunks and Mai to in theory return to the future, 18 stops them. Hey, where do you think you're going kiddos? We gotta get back! Our future needs our help to rebuild! 18 bonks him on the head. Relax kiddo, haven't you been paying attention to what we've been trying to tell you? She's right Trunks, Gohan said. You don't have to go back yet. Take some time for yourselves, both you and Mai. Trunks and Mai were stunned. You've done enough, you two, snarled Vegeta. Listen to them. 
Go and have fun. You deserve it. At least for a while. Whenever you want to, you can go back. But for now, stay. Hmm. I suppose we could at least stay for a while, Trunks. It is nice here, and we do have friends, but what are we going to do with this? Oh, I can handle this, said Whis and then Beerus, who had arrived to see what had occurred. Whis took hold of the jar. I know just where to put this. I'll keep it on our spice rack, next to the garlic. Beerus scowled. I don't like the idea of time travelers still flitting about the place. So promise me this, young man. When you do go back to your time, you must never return, or else you will have me to answer to. Do you understand? Trunks and Mai nod frantically. Okay then. I guess they've been ordered by Beerus to have fun here. Hercule had informed the couple that he had been approached to make a movie called Great Saiyaman vs. Mr. Satan, and he wished to include them in the proceedings, seeing as he was the main star and all he could do what he wanted. I could get you some passes on set, so that means you can go anywhere you want. It might be even fun for little baby Pan to have a day out with her folks, and of course getting to see her grandpa do his job. Dad, you can just come over and see her any time, you know. I know, sweetie, but it's just doing movies means I can do that. Plus, make a little bit of money, too. Adele and Gohan were very unimpressed. We don't need the money, Dad. Oh, come on, please! It sounds like such a cool movie! The couple look at each other and... Oh, well, all right, fine. On set, Barry Khan does his thing and tries to woo Adele. But this time, she takes his advances even worse than the original. Not only does she reject him outright in front of everybody, but she even slaps him, which sends him careening into a pile of used boxes and crumpled up in a heap. Oops, I guess I forgot to manage my key. The crew all laugh their heads off and cheer the Dell. Oh, cheers, thanks, lady. You have no idea how much we've been longing to do that. That guy, he's a total jerk. With the crew on her side, Videl bows in jest whilst Barry seeks revenge. This time around, not with Gohan. He wants his revenge on Videl. How dare she show him up like that? Later that day, a bank robbery is reported, and now feeling pumped, Videl decides to break out the great Saiyaman 2 gear for the first time since she had Pan. Why not? She was feeling quite good. She goes to help Gohan out. The crime is halted with no incident, but the press, oh, they go nuts. Great Saiyaman 2 spotted. Is our heroine of justice back for good? Read the headlines. Khan seethes under this. He hates this, as this is taking up valuable real estate for his comeback movie. Oh, he decides to hatch a plan from this. When the couple returns to the set, this time with Pan and the stroller, Khan approaches them and apologizes for his behavior. But he does state that there had been a rewrite overnight as well to include Great Saiyaman 2, seeing as she was trending recently, having returned from obscurity. He requests that Fidel become the lead stunt woman, hoping she'd be made a fool of and even might get hurt. That'll show her. Gohan can see right through this and says to Videl she doesn't have to do this. They can just leave at any time. She has nothing to prove. No, Gohan. I want to. This is personal now. Even Pan nods in solidarity and gives Barry the stink eye. When the time comes, she dons the costume provided and does the stunts without problems at all. And in fact, wows the stagehands immensely. Wow. Not only is she sassy, but she's pretty sprightly too. Where has she been all our lives? Pan was cheering her mother on, whilst Barry was fuming this was not working out at all. He walks on stage and asks to have a word with Adele personally. Not worried in the slightest for her safety, Videl goes with him, leaving Gohan with Pan, looking a little worried. This doesn't seem right. And this is also when Jarko arrives and talks to Gohan, saying that there had been a local alien-like disturbance on Earth with an escaped entity known as Watagashi in this district. The readings from his biochip indicate that he was just here. Hmm. You're not an alien, are you, Gohan? He points to where it was, and then Gohan immediately is concerned. We need to find Videl. Let's go, Jarko! Gohan sprints off, with Jarko hastily running behind him, and Pan choosing this moment to fly by her father. Them two wound up to even notice. When alone, Barry accosts Videl and tries to discredit her. I have powerful friends who will ruin you and your family. Soon your father will have no choice but to disown you for how much shame you've brought to him! Videl remains steadfast, not scared of this guy at all. She goes to leave, but Barry grabs her. And this is when Watagashi's powers come forth. Videl is shocked to see this power, but she is ready to counter. I knew it. Knew what, silly girl? Not only are you a model example of a jerk, but you're also a weakling. What? Videl powers up, this time with a strange aura she hadn't felt before. This was weird. 
and she felt lots of weird things lately. Stop it. This had been the first time she had been this pumped since she got pregnant, but no matter. She was ready to beat this guy to a pulp. She wanted to. He was clearly not what he seemed. Barry is helpless to her power, and this is when his Watagashi powers come forth even further, and it decimates the film studio. This meaning Videl having to retreat, not wanting anyone else to get hurt. Gohan and Jaco spot the hulking beast emerge and go in to assist. Well, I mean, I mean Jaco assists from the sidelines. It becomes very quickly clear that with Gohan fighting alongside her, Watagashi cannot outmatch them. Whilst fighting, Gohan notices Videl's strange aura too, and takes note of it. He definitely will ask Whis about this next time they meet. This is very odd, but it doesn't seem to be harming her. For now, they beat the monster down, and in fact, Videl goes in for the kill. But Videl, we can't kill him. Think of Pan. Videl is furious with this hideous man that tried to tarnish her name, but she did back off, and instead just knocked Barry out cold, seemingly out of Watagashi's body, and thusly captures the monster for Jaco to take away from Earth. With the prisoner gone, Barry is powerless and accosted by both Gohan and Videl, and even a little Babby Pan, told to either clean up his act or they will come for him again. It's wise not to get on the bad side of the great Saiyan man. The coward he is accepts this, and the movie plows on to great success. Once the movie has been released, Gohan is reminded about his question to Whis. During their next training session, he asks the angel about Videl's strange key, and the attendant nods in understanding. Marvellous! It seems like Lord Beerus' theory is proving to be most accurate. Theory? What theory was that? He believed that by your wife merely attending training sessions whilst she was expecting, it would leave an impression on her. While she wasn't able to directly implement it for obvious reasons, her mind took on board the basic principles of it. Not to mention the sheer amount of it on display being absorbed by her. Anyone would. What? What did she absorb? God Key Gohan. God Key? She has it too? Probably not nearly as much as you and your Saiyan friends, but perhaps enough for it to be coursing through her veins in some degree, and more importantly, into your then developing daughter. Pan has it too? Maybe, but it's too early to say for sure, but we gods are quite long lasting. We are prepared to wait for the results to make themselves known. Gohan was astonished. Wow. Now this is where things change slightly. Now instead of Goku triggering the tournament, we are having it so Zeno alone, just the one this time, reminds himself of it. Without another playmate, his boredom is even more pronounced than the original, and so the idea about this tournament from the Universe 6 arc flows to his mind much more quickly and easily. Besides, he was planning it anyway regardless of Goku poking his mind in the original, as was proven by the end of the arc. In the sky, the GP arrives to request Beerus and Whis to go to the sacred world of the Kais immediately to receive important news. When they get there, the GP is there with them and announces the tournament, with the penalty for losing being erasure. Total, universal, erasure. All for the entertainment of the Omni King. This is... this is all for fun? He couldn't believe it. The Omni King, whom he had greeted in the tournament between Universe 6, had suddenly enacted this barbaric and stupid idea of a contest, with horrific consequences. No way. Why would the King of Everything do this? We got to tell the others, including Vegeta. Are you sure, Dad? He's already dealing with the arrival of his second born soon. He's probably stressed out of his mind right now. Oh, and Whis, says Beerus, you might want to help Bulmer out this time. She remembers what you said you could do from when Pan was born. Whis laughed and nodded. Oh, very well. I don't want to get on her bad side. She might stop the treats. Well, in that case, we definitely have to go and help her. Beerus never hadn't been this animated in years. When they get there, they indeed find a nervous Vegeta, but it becomes clear that they do need to tell him. But he refuses to attend, saying he needs to wait for his daughter to be born, which is when Whis goes off to do his thing. He arrives to see Bulma, so massive that she can barely move around, and acts all cheery to which the engineer is not best pleased. I don't need your cheer right now, Whis. I feel like a whale. Oh, I can help with that. I remember your promise. Before Bulma realizes, Whis pokes his staff on her stomach and within seconds, Bulma is born cleanly and swaddled in cloth from the angels. Bulma felt her body lighten in an instant. And then here, here was her daughter. No pain, no mess. Nothing. With Bulla safe and sound, Vegeta is prompted to take part in the contest when Bulma gives her blessing. The 
It was only an hour out of her day anyway. Over the course of the next couple of days, the team for Universe 7 is assembled much more swiftly this time round. The biggest changes come quite early, with Videl notably taking the place of Master Roshi, who declines the invitation, saying that he wasn't really cut out for this frontline combat anymore. The soldier battle from the Resurrection F arc was more than enough excitement for this old man. Trunks also declines the invitation, him and Mai having had a great time exploring the world without a care and not having to do anything or needing work. Bomber did give them a very hefty amount of pocket money. I think it's too soon to get myself involved in something so serious, guys. Mai and I really need this rest period before we go back. I appreciate the request though, but I'm sure you can assemble a team without my help. Gohan understands where he's coming from, but Vegeta is a little disappointed that his son is shirking this offer, but he does ultimately understand eventually. Krillin and 18 gladly step up this time, neither of them needing prompting or cajoling or in the latter's case, bribery. Alongside Piccolo, them as well as Videl and Gohan train together, and because of this, as well as all the downtime they had spent training since the Boo arc, both Piccolo and Krillin are quite a bit stronger than in the original for their counterparts. And as for 18, she is far stronger than her original self, having spent a lot of time training with Videl, as Vizuli and now Adel, and of course being one of the lead practitioners at the new Satan Castle Martial Arts School. And then she alone goes off to convince her brother to join the team instead of Goku doing it. He does accept this, having noticed how fired up his sister had become. And also, he couldn't bear the thought of seeing her stronger than him. I gotta prove to you that I'm no weakling, sis. Now, I bet you're thinking that Goku's, oh, going to be reluctant to take part because of his newfound nature, wanting to be on the sidelines as per usual these days, but not so. He gets prompting from chi chi of all people to take part. Goku was in a rut, not sure what to do. He felt personally compelled to fight in the tournament, sure, having seen firsthand the announcement and how scared he was, but he was again reminded of his own desire to lead a quieter life than before. Goku, this isn't some random villain, says Chi Chi. This is the fate of everything. I don't think you can skip out of this one. And besides, if this tournament is as short as you say it is, it's no big deal. I'm sure you and the others will come out on top. Just be sure to be back for dinner, okay? Goku laughs and ultimately agrees to join the team. The team is assembled, nine strong, but they need ten. Majin Buu is no good, he's fast asleep for two months, and Hercule absolutely crushed by this because of his friend's laziness. There's no Trunks, obviously, no Roshi. What about Freezer? Yep, Freezer is still called upon. This time around, though, it's not just Goku who suggests it, but Gohan as well. Are you serious? cries out Vegeta. I expected this from your father, but you? Have you gone mad? shouted Vegeta, who took personal umbrage from this, having seen his nemesis being packed up by himself to Hippo. There is no one else willing to participate, Vegeta. There's not much time left either. The rules don't say fighters have to be living. I feel there's unfinished business with him anyway. Vegeta is cursing profusely. And Videl? She initially doesn't know what to think. Gohan? Are you sure about this? I'm sure. If he kicks up, you and I can take him down. After all, we've done it before. Fidel nods and nervously sighs with her husband, having first-hand experience of taking Frieza down, admittedly. Having bartered with the tyrant, both Gohan and Goku arrive to collect him, this time with no sign of Universe 9 interference, seeing as Universe 7 aren't seen by the Universal Collective as the instigators of this frightening competition this time around. The meeting is very icy, but Frieza is pleased to see his former rival and now his new one. I do appreciate the welcoming committee, gentlemen, but you needn't worry. I don't plan to be causing trouble, at least too often. So long as I get what I asked for, I will play along with your game. And besides, I very much would like to get to know you more, Son Gohan. You intrigue me muchly. Gohan looks stern. The feeling's mutual. This doesn't mean we're friends, though. Let's be clear about that. Oh, crystal clear, young one. Again, I shall play ball. For now. Back at Fortune Teller Barber's place, Frieza was preparing to head back with Gohan by an instant transmission. But the Emperor made one request before leaving. Before we go and see your friend, Son Gohan, I wish to showcase what I have learnt whilst being dead for the second time. Just to show that I can be useful. Uh, what you learnt? Oh, don't think I just sat idle whilst I was cast back to that hideous place. I've learnt from my mistake last time we met. He powers up and showcases his true Golden Freezer power. The sparks of gold and yellow light the scene, and Videl looks very concerned that the tyrant was about to break his promise 
and they hadn't even left the compound yet. Come on, Gohan, get this over with and let's go. We can't keep the others waiting. She then decides to sit down at the side of the arena, looking very bored, hoping that her husband would quickly put Frieza in his place. But it wasn't as simple as that. His ultimate power was pretty strong, and the infusion of God Key that he got definitely gave him a leg up. He was stronger than in the Resurrection F arc, but Frieza's gain and improved stamina definitely made this battle more of an equal affair than the half Saiyan had bargained for, catching our hero short. In the end, Videl had to stand up and look very worried that Gohan would actually be taken out of commission before the tournament even began. Gohan, let me help! He's playing dirty! Gohan was holding back Frieza's blows, but was remaining steadfast. No, Videl! I got this! I want this! Videl was stunned. Gohan wanted Frieza to beat him to a pulp? What? Clearly, Gohan had some bones to pick with this guy. <laughs> Wise decision, Son Gohan. For you see, it proves something. We're not so different, you and I. Oh? Why's that? It's not all about strength, my friend. My respect towards you. It's far more entrenched than something so basic as that. You remind me of me. Of uh, you? Very much so. Frieza's face crinkles into a nasty smile. We are so alike. Children of powerful men, prodigious in potential ourselves, immense in intellect and cunning, all of this having been nurtured by our own minds, self-taught masters of our own respective fields. I like the cut of your chips on Gohan. That is why I am taking part in this little game. I wish to see you fight, this time on the same side. Gohan isn't convinced by this. In fact, he is somewhat sickened by this notion, because Frieza wasn't wrong. They were sort of alike. But when it comes down to it, Gohan assured himself. At least I don't take enjoyment in the pain of others. That is where we differ. The fight continues for a little while longer. Frieza feeling more energized, having revealed his true motivation to fight. Soon though, this does catch the attention of Beerus and Whis, they being alerted to the sheer amount of power being put on display from both parties, quickly ending this tussle, telling them to get a grip and focus on the job at hand. Frieza, I'm glad to see that you've stepped up your game since we last spoke, but now is not the right time to be letting your hair down, or whatever you constitute for hair. Beerus! Lord Beerus, don't forget that. Want me to remind you personally? Beerus hovers towards Frieza and gives him the iciest of looks. Do play nicely with these mortals, Freezy boy. I would like to come back to some sort of universe I recognize. Or else, whatever deal you've concocted is off. He raises one finger and it sparks purple, and that makes Freezer back down with the utmost of contempt, though. In his mind, he is raging. Now with the battle quelled, the group teleport back to Capture Corp and regroup. The dragon team looking very sternly at Frieza, who tries to remain composed despite his battle scars of now. That night, as the group were getting some sleep before the big day, Videl and Gohan were struggling to get any rest to drift off. Gohan, do you really think we can win? Who knows what perils we'll come up against? I don't know, honey, but we gotta do our best. For Pan. For everyone. Videl nodded, and they kissed. Well, they... More than kiss, let's just say. Then it came. The group were having to be transported off to the world of Void in the same way as the original, and the entire team taking the site at the arena. Seven different universes were being transported to the same location. Now, for those asking about the exhibition match, this still did take place, but this time it was performed between universes 9 and 6, since universe 7 had just about pulled up their mortal level trousers slightly, thanks to Shin's training with Videl and 18, making him slightly stronger and slightly more confident, and a little more able to help rebuild his universe so there's not 28 civilized planets left. See Shin, that wasn't so hard now, was it? Universe 9 almost won this time. Had it not been for Kale going nuts, she broke the tie, with Karma losing. As a result, the news of this defeat did not go down well with Vegeta. Did nothing of what I've taught you get through that thick head of yours? Kaba was extremely apologetic for this lack of strength. I'm sorry, Master Vegeta. I'll do better this time. You'd better. If I find you to be slacking here, then you can forget any further training or advice from I. I do not wish to be affiliated with such weaklings. 
Vegeta walks off, leaving Kaba dejected. Videl saw all of this go down, and went over to Kaba, soothing his upset demeanor. Don't worry, Vegeta's not all that cranky. Only most of the time. I'm sure you'd do just fine. Thank you, but excuse me. Who are you? Oh, I'm Videl, from Universe 7, with those guys. She points over to Goku and the others. Oh, so you know Goku too? I'm married to his son, actually. Khalifa then just wades in and eyes up Videl herself. So are you one of the Saiyans that Kaba talked about? Oh, no, I'm not a Saiyan. Well, I'm maybe, maybe some part Saiyan, but BORING! Where are the Saiyans? She just stomps off, not interested in Videl, and looks over to Goku. Videl is very annoyed by this snub, and Kaba this time apologizes. Don't worry, Khalifa's not all that cranky. Only most of the time. With the tournament rules being explained one last time, the battle commences, and the initial fracas play out identically, with half of Universe 7 going out to battle solo, and the other half sticking close to the center of the arena. In fact, the tournament is mostly just a carbon copy of the original, since there's only one change in Universe 7, so we'll not go too in-depth, at least not for the first half. But, there are some notable changes that I think we will cover in this part that I think you'll enjoy. First off, let us address the chestnut in the room. Krillin still takes on Majora, and takes him out like he did in the original, but he doesn't get punted out of the arena by Frost. He is surprised by him, but he is able to hold Frost off for quite a while, and provides quite the interesting battle. The Ice Con Man, though, is infuriated that his cheap shot didn't yield an actual elimination of Universe 7. It didn't work, and he's very much getting desperate and irate, as you should know. He is quick to anger as we've seen in the anime. Krillin can see this though coming a mile off and is using this to his advantage, having recognized the similarity to Freeze's temper back in the Namek saga. What's the matter, buddy? Things not going your way? Well, that's life for ya! Frost is spitting feathers now. Soon enough, he is making very rash strikes and punches against the little guy. That is until Freeza shows up. Earlier than before, actually. Having trouble, are we, friend? Freeza, thank goodness you're here. Can you help me with this pest? Oh, that, oh that's right. The, the deal we had. Sure. Frost nods frantically and Krillin is just disappointed. Just as I thought. You're turning against us already. Don't you understand the importance of this tournament, Frieza? Frieza pats Krillin on the head. Relax, small one. I'll make this quick and easy for you. He is powering up an energy blast to which Frost sees and joins him. Side by side, they are evilly smirking at Krillin and he's cowering before Freezer turns to Frost. By the way, my friend, one important lesson you should learn from all of this. Though, so, what's that? Trust no one. He turns his blast towards Frost and fires it in his direction. Frost is helpless. He cannot dodge it in time. And the beam sends him straight out of the arena and out of the contest. And out of life, him being erased because of his outburst of anger later on. Krillin is stunned. You, you planned this? That thing was a pitiful shadow of myself. So meek. I couldn't allow him to continue. Now be gone before I change my mind and actually do send you packing as well. With that, Krillin runs away pronto, with Frieza continuing his typical display of slick play. Now, what about Goku in all of this? Well, he is still showing his expert fighting skills, but he really isn't taking the situation seriously. He really isn't going at full chat just yet. This is why I kept Krillin in he replaces Roshi's element of the story. Instead of the old man, Krillin is the one to take on Ganos at full power, using up all of his power to stop the Birdman. He had to. Goku can sense Krillin giving up more energy than was necessary. So he rushes to the scene, but it's too late. Krillin has fired the blast and it connects. Krillin, stop! You don't need to go all out like this. Let me help you! Goku, I've gone further than I thought I would. I want to do my best for you, for our team. But don't worry, I know what I'm doing. Goku is floored by Krillin's bravery and determination. When Garnos is fully removed from the scene, Krillin's power collapses, barely any life energy left. Goku grits his teeth and curses his situation. Damn it, Krillin, I could have helped you. But I held back, I doubted myself. I can't do that anymore. I have to give it everything I've got and more. Goku. Krillin weakly mutters. Toss me out. Please. I'm spent. Do this for me. I don't want anyone else to do it but you. Goku nods and holds back the tears of respect. He picks up Krillin and just lightly drops him off the ring. 
the small one landing in the stand, now with the respective viewers. Not bad. A little brash in my taste, but not bad. Krillin will take that. Now having been shown the impact of this contest, Goku steps up a gear, and for the first time in years, powers up to his fullest immediately, and begins to make a bigger impact in the story. In fact, so much of an impact, something sparks within him. This gets the attention of Jiren, like in the original, and the Saiyan has to really use everything in his arsenal to figure against him, including using the Genki Dharma like we see in the original. And this is where Ultra Instinct still comes in. Now, I can hear you all say, but Masako, Goku's not strong enough to use it. It's not all about strength. When the attack fails and out from it appears Goku with this Ultra Instinct sign power, it takes Beerus aback. Him being just as shocked as you are. What? How did Goku get that? Whis, though, is delighted. I knew it! I knew Goku had it in him! Had what in him, Whis? Explain! Whis is more than happy to do so. Lord Beerus, think about it. Just because Goku isn't as strong in the traditional sense as Gohan and Vegeta, his combat skill and intellect are second to none from what I've seen. Finally, Goku's broken through the glass ceiling he made for himself. He still has something left to aim for, and he knows it now. Whis is smiling the most he has had in centuries. I do believe the odds of us winning have vastly improved. Beerus is still irritated. I don't like losing bets, though. He hands Whis a bag of Earth Sweets, which was the prize for who got Ultra Instinct first. When Goku does fall out of Ultra Instinct's sign against Jiren, Frieza still heals him up, but this time, for more genuinely compassionate and helpful reasons. Good to see you're finally back in the game, Son Goku. Your son's determination is clearly leaving its mark on you. Now we get into the biggest question. What about Kepler, Masako? Are we still going to get our Saiyan fan service? Well, we do have Kepler, so don't you worry. But Goku doesn't fight them. We have our own fusion. Beerus would anticipate that Shampa would play some kind of dirty trick like this. He was just waiting for his brother to do so. Once Kepler did pop up and Zeno wasn't going to disqualify them because this looked really cool, you know, not getting in trouble for having outside items, Beerus smirked. Good, we can act. Hey! Don't just stand there, mortals! Use the Patara! Shampa looks concerned. What? You have Patara as well, brother? Beerus grinned. I knew you would pull a fast one like this, my brother. Sorry if this gets in the way of your plans. He blows a raspberry at his brother. With the signal made, the battle of the brothers begins. The Dell and 18 get into position and fuse into Adel. Kefla is naturally gravitated to this and is more than happy to fight this strong fusion. Not bad. I can certainly do with some warm-up. Kepler remains in her base form for the time being, taunting Adel, but their battle commences properly, and in this state, Adel is doing pretty well and getting to show Khalifla, to some extent, a thing or two. She can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this fully Saiyan fusion. This is getting her more and more excited. This, this is incredible. I'm able to go up against Saiyans now. With Adel motivated more than ever, she is even starting to better Kepler, who is getting more and more frustrated. But then she remembers something, realizing what she can do, and smirks. You're good, but are you good enough against this? Adele at first is confused, but then groans. All right, Super Saiyan. Ah! Now with Super Saiyan Kefla, Adele is immediately the weaker of the two. She is able to claw back some ground when pushing her infinite engine to the maximum, but the power gap is just still too big to whittle Kefla down substantially. And as a result, Adele falls out of the ring. But Gohan, Gohan saw the whole thing go down. He transmits over to Vegeta and pulls out his own set of Patara. Vegeta does grunt, but complies. Champa, thinking that he'd won, is stunned to see Vegahan show up. Two sets! Beerus' eyes widen. Oh, I thought you had thought the same thing. Guess you're not so smart after all. With Kefla slightly worn down, Vegahan comes in to eliminate Kefla and he does very quickly, in the blue form, with a final Kamehameha. Now having avenged Adel, he then goes up against Jiren, who once again was awoken by the power on display from the fusion battle. In this conflict, Vegehan is able to deal a fair amount of damage to Jiren, definitely enough to reduce the alien's power capacity, but he still cannot win though against Jiren. And ultimately, the fusion separates due to all the exertion, and Jiren just chucks out a weakened Gohan and Vegeta from the ring. Having regained his composure,
Goku is the one to take on Toppo. We don't see though Toppo going god mode in the way that we expect in the anime, because he is actually fighting an honourable fighter. Now without any contempt for Goku whatsoever, Toppo is fully respecting Goku right from the get go for his action and conduct. If these were more amiable times, my friend, I would shake your hand and buy you a drink. But I'm afraid I must fight for my universe and bring justice to this ridiculous contest. Goku nods. Sounds great. Let's get serious. Goku powers up and the two duke it out, with Toppo then going to use his god powers as Goku is proving quite difficult. I must apologize if this form is quite rough around the edges, but- No worries, friend. I understand. Go for it. Go all out. Toppo nods and lets loose. This too awakens his ultra instinct powers once more, for the second and last time. In the end, this battle is fierce and Goku does come out winning thanks to his more agile prowess. Despite Toppo's power being stronger, he's still quite a bulky boy. Now we head for the final battle, with a softened up Jiren going up against Goku, Frieza and Seventeen. We head back to the original outcome though, with Seventeen winning. However, Goku is a little bit stronger here because he's not used Ultra Instinct three times, and Frieza has regained his respect towards him, and together they fight and beat down Jiren like in the show. Universe 7 win, and the balance of normality is restored. Now with a chance to catch a breather, Goku asks Whis about the weird power he felt before blacking out. Goku, you've done it. You've broken through your own barriers. It's like what the Elder Kai told you. God Ki is a whole other level of power. You've now fully understood that and can go forward without worry of peaking. At least not just yet. You are merely at the beginning of your journey. Believe me. Goku is stunned. His old drive to get stronger was seemingly being restored to him. But he sighs. That's good to know, Whis. But I'm in no rush. If it comes to me, then it comes to me. If not, it doesn't matter. I can wait. We smiles. Very well. I'll be ready to train you up when the itch arises. Knowing that, Goku now has something to keep in mind. This means he can continue to keep doing what he was doing, without any guilt. Having said that, he is now satisfied to know that he has achieved more and can achieve more, but he doesn't feel the need to rush back to his old ways just yet. As for Gohan, he feels like he led a good team, and he once again congratulates Videl for doing so well fused against a Saiyan fusion even. Videl though, is a little bit bummed out about this. We were so close to beating her too. If only it wasn't for that blessed Super Saiyan. Gohan hugs her though and promises to step up the training in case a rematch was in the works they could do better. They then fist bump in solidarity. So now we are into the final part. Let's cover the likes of Broly first. Overall, it doesn't really change all that much since Goku doesn't really have much of a relationship with Broly in the first half of the movie, only really ingratiating himself properly with the guy at the end of the movie. Also, the Saiyan flashback scenes are exactly identical, so no changes there. So when the present day action starts, Goku and Gohan can be seen training together at Mount Palzu, whereas Vegeta is training with Whis on Earth, him having come over with Beerus to, yet again, feast on Earth's food and chillax. Gohan has now affirmed himself to be the leader of the Dragon Team now, with Goku acting as more sort of senior advisor and tutor to help his son get used to this mantle. Of course, Gohan does have a job as well in an academic institute, and he does do some good conferences every now and again, but in this timeline, again, the Videl Balanced timeline, he can actually consider martial arts and fighting in a good light to clear his mind after a particularly rough day and conference. For Goku, this is good too. He is feeling like he can help and he can help out his son develop, keeping himself trim as well and on the ball with the powers that are now becoming apparent as things get more powerful. He isn't coasting per se, but he's not really desperate to go at a million miles an hour like he used to. So when the impending arrival of Broly comes about, it's the likes of Vegeta and Gohan who take on the big lug, with Videl coming along with Bulma to supervise from the sidelines and providing support in case things get rough. You know, she's got a bodyguard. And as for Beerus, he's now babysitting two babies now, Pan and Bulla, but he's not complaining. With Bulla, he's inspecting her and mulling over her potential as well. I wonder if you too could be a good sparring partner someday. You're becoming quite enamored with babies these days, Lord Beerus. Getting broody, are we? Beerus snaps. Hold your tongue there, Angel. I'm merely taking an interest in the future of our universal benefit, as well as its guardians. 
In my opinion, it's better to understand them when they're mewling infants. Whis chuckles as he slurps down the cocktail. A pina colada. The battle with Broly is basically the same, with Vegeta and Gohan having to fuse. But not with Patara this time. With Piccolo's help, the warriors fuse with the Metamoran dance. As well as Gohan having some sort of experience from Videl using the Metamoran fusion with 18 when they create Vizuli. In the end, the fusion that we get is... Gogeta! Eh? The H is silent, so Gogeta, in his blue power, defeats Broly, and Shilai still gets them out of danger with the Dragon Balls. The biggest changes come at the end of the story when things are wrapping up. Videl and Bulma are on Vampa, having used their spacecraft to get there, then providing vital supplies to help the trio survive more comfortably on Vampa, away from Freezer's influence for the time being. That and they don't have to live off a of bug juice. Videl also provides Chi-Lai some good advice as to how to handle Saiyans, and how they operate, having a half-Saiyan husband, as well as socialising with full Saiyans for quite a long time now. Chi-Lai does appreciate this advice, but feels like she can cope with her own style as well. The two of them laugh it off, and just then, Gohan arrives to check in on the group to see how they're getting on, via instant transmission as well as bringing along Vegeta, who decided to just check things out for himself. Why is Vegeta there? Well, he saw in Broly a potential challenge in the future, in case Gohan or Kakarot packed in their fighting arms. He's like an insurance policy. He finds Broly and tells him to stay strong and not slack off. One day I might come to train you. You had better not waste my time when I return. Broly is a little unsure though about this. Forgive me, Vegeta but I'm not one to find enjoyment in such things. It brings me great pain. I will not have such talent be squandered! Gohan has to break it up, and assures Broly that he will help ease his worries and doubts about letting out his powers. I had problems with rage and anger myself when I was young. I can teach you how to control it if you like, Broly. Then, Vegeta, you can fight him. Vegeta growls, but ultimately complies. This then means that after the movie canonically ends, Videl and Gohan regularly come to visit Vampa, thanks to instant transmission, and spends time with Lemo, Chi-Lai, and Broly. So instead of them just being sparring partners and side characters, Broly and Gohan actually become good friends, as well as Videl coming to help educate Broly with basic things, as well as some good meditation techniques from Gohan to quell his troubled mind. He's a more rounded character. And on occasion, they come to Earth via Gohan to have some breaks from the yellow sky and further relax. You know, no bugs in sight. So now we fast forward to just before the 26th World Martial Arts Tournament. With Pan now a little girl of about 5 years old or so, she is showing more of a desire to train with her father in this story. And now, a wildcat approaches more often. Beerus is now taking more of an interest in being around her and seeing what she can do. Whis was there as well to make sure he didn't go too far with her, of course. Remember, Lord Beerus, she is still small. I know what I'm doing, Whis. I was a child once, it can't be that hard. Whis not convinced. Thanks to both her parents being keen fighters, Pan also wanted to get involved. And thanks to this extra gusto, she was pretty keen in the original already, we have it that thanks to her additional exposure to S-cells, God Key, and Videl being quite strong herself when Pan was in her belly, Pan is able to go Super Saiyan. She first did it, in fact, when Beerus was there, getting impatient, and the look of delight on his face was so rare that Whis made sure to take a picture of it. You see, Lord Beerus? You can smile. Beerus being too elated at this point to care. At last, progress towards the legendary Super Saiyan, and so soon. Gohan and Videl look a little worried. Is the cat getting a little bit too hyped up already? Pan, though, was loving this attention and this power. She would zoom about the place in the time in this golden form. Uncle Beerus, look what I can do! Oh, I'm watching, Pan! I couldn't be any more proud! As a result, Beerus and Whis will attend the tournament, but not to compete. They are there for amusement, as well as to see how far Pan can go in the competition, given that it was now a free-for-all. Kids and adults all fight in the same group. But before that, though, the family unit of Gohan, Pan, and Videl have moved out of the city and back to near Mount Palzu, where Goku and Chi-Chi live, so that Pan can live in the country and experience a similar lifestyle to a father, more laid back. And thanks to Gohan having instant transmission, they could still be the great Saiyan man, Gohan can still work in the city, Videl can still work at the new Satan Castle Dojo, 
and they can respond instantly to whatever trouble arises in all of those cases. Gohan and Videl would also train regularly themselves, and this meant that their powers still increased, but understandably not as fast as before, given this is peacetime. As for Goku, he had been able to refine his Ultra Instinct power, and even break through to another version, Mastered Ultra Instinct, albeit not nearly as rapid as in the original story. He was still working on this power, and he's trying to get it so that means he can use it at will all the time, but he was pleased with his progress thus far, not in any rush. Videl also took an interest in Ultra Instinct, but she was realistic in her limitations. She's probably not going to be achieving this anytime soon, but Whis would always say, thanks to all of her efforts, that if she ever wanted to, she can come and try and find out whether she can. She kept that in mind. This Whis being far more open to training people having seen the talent on Earth. Vegeta, meanwhile, has relaxed a little bit, still pushing his Super Saiyan Blue powers to the limit, but not being nearly as head up about being the strongest out there because technically he sort of is? Until Goku could get a good handle on Ultra Instinct. He was finding his own avenue of power. So, the time comes for the contest. The entire gang descend upon Papaya Island, with Goku and Gohan noticing a familiar power signature from a young boy. That's oob for you folks. He was taking part in the contest to bring back the prize money for his village. In the matchup, Goku still gets drawn with Oob, but this time around, as well as also what we know from the Moro arc, Oob's place in Goku's enthusiasm is justified instead of being randomly weird. However, instead of breaking off the fight there and then and just going off, Goku asks for Oob to stick around, as he wants to talk to him later about some possible opportunities. With that, Oob agrees and does his best, but Goku does win the round. In the end though, an unexpected winner is had. Pan goes on to win the tournament, her using Super Saiyan a little too often for everyone else's liking. Goku let her win to boost her confidence, and also she did trick him into falling out of the ring, he didn't intend that. For the grand final, it was her versus her grandpa, Hercule. In a very mature move, Hercule doesn't ask Pan to let him win. He couldn't do that to a child, especially his granddaughter, and for one brimming with such happiness and talent as well. He gets knocked out of the ring, obviously, and Pan wins the whole thing, him proclaiming that he is now using this moment to retire from professional competition, passing the torch on to the next generation. His next generation. This Hercule is a little more humble than the original. Let it be known that my grandbaby will become a fantastic fighter when she grows up. You saw it here first, everyone. The crowd cheer, and Pan does a victory lap around the stadium. After the contest, Pan runs up to her uncle Beerus and asks him whether he saw a win. Oh my child, I saw the whole thing. In fact, he looks around to see if anyone else is watching. Come with me, I have something to show you. Whis looks a little perturbed. Are you sure this is wise, Lord Beerus? Don't you see? This is our chance. We can see whether she's now the Super Saiyan God I've been waiting for. Whis sighs and with that, they kidnap Pan. When the award ceremony is due to begin, Nobody can find Pan. Gohan and Videl are very worried initially as they can't sense her energy anywhere. Goku and Vegeta are very irate. What? Who would dare kidnap a child? Raged Vegeta, him holding on to Bulla for dear life in case the same thing happened again. Upon further consideration though, Videl then asks Bulma something, whether she's seen Whis and Beerus lately. When Bulma replies saying, no, she hasn't seen them, Videl nods. Gohan. I think I know where she's gone. She grabs Gohan by the arm, and after explaining her theory, they transmit away. As that happens, Goku and Oob get talking, Oob getting worried about Pan too, offering his help to look for her. Goku now knows for sure that he's a good egg. He feels obliged to train this kid, but this time, unlike the original, he invites Oob to come stay with them at Mount Palzu. Chi Chi likes this idea because it's a chance to look after a young one again, you know, empty nest syndrome and all that, more directly than just playing with Pan. Oob is a little unsure about this, but then Goku explains that he can teleport, so if he gets homesick, he can just go back to his village anytime he wants. And also, Bulma can lend them some money if they need it. Bulma, with her arms slightly twisted, does agree to this, but she would have rather have been asked more directly and nicely instead of being dragged into it. So, the mystery of Pan's whereabouts is solved. Gohan and Videl arrive at Beerus's place. On the way, they assume that Beerus was just too eager to wait to see whether Pan had become the legendary Super Saiyan or not, gotten strong enough to fight him. They weren't worried for her safety, I mean Beerus wouldn't endanger her life, but 
you might get a little bit overly keen. When they do arrive in the main garden area of Beerus' palace, they expect to see the cat fighting their daughter. But not so. Instead of fighting, Beerus and Pan are... playing. The cat looking like he's having the time of his life. Whis then walks in, carrying a tray with a couple of hot chocolates on it. Oh, hello, you two. Fancy seeing you here. Had I known you were coming, I'd have made you some more of this. Gohan walks up to Beerus, looking a little stern. Lord Beerus, you can't just take our daughter when you feel like. Pan, are you okay? Pan nods. Oh, I'm having a great time. Uncle Beerus is really good at playing. Beerus blushes. Don't get me wrong. I, I had intended on training her personally, but... um. Ugh. He turns away out of embarrassment. But then Whis decides to step in. Oh, that was the original idea. Lord Beerus was very keen in training her in the ways of the God of Destruction, but as you can see, playtime got the better of him. Beerus is still looking very bashful, but isn't stopping the play session. With some extra cocoa, Fidel and Gohan come to a compromise. They don't stop Beerus seeing Pan or his experiment. They hatch a plan. They will allow Beerus and Whis to be Pan's part-time babysitter and teacher in martial arts. One condition though, Lord Beerus. Beerus then reverts to his cocky self. Oh, you're bargaining with a god of destruction, Gohan. Choose your words wisely. More like I'm bargaining with a kidnapper. <laughs> Whatever, spill it. No serious training until she's a teenager, when her body can take it. Beerus growls, but then nods. Oh yeah, Fidel adds. Marin and Bola should come too. What? That's three conditions! Beerus snarls. Why should I agree to that? Pan should have sparring partners who are her age and of similar ability. Think about it, Lord Beerus. You can have not just one strong fighter under you, but three. This was the right thing to say. Hmm. I'll consider it. Whis then beams. Oh, to have such laughter and innocence once more. Huh? In what way, Uncle Whis? Asks Pan. Oh, my child, when Beerus first became the God of Destruction, he was far more jovial and fresh than he is now, millions of years ago. It reminds me of those times. Beerus growls to prove Whis's point. So, with that, the future looks bright, as Pan, Marin, and Bulla are trained by Beerus and Whis, with Pan being the main focus, of course, for the cat. The Earth is looking like it's in safe hands with strong defenders, now and into the next generation. And that is all thanks to Videl being a Z-Fighter. And that's where we end things. So what did you folks think? Did you feel Videl's presence changed things for the better? How would have you handled Videl in this scenario? Leave a comment below and let's get this discussion going. And I shall see you in the next video. Catch you later!